Hey, kids, do you like wrestling? Well, we like wrestling, too. We are Shake Them Ropes here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Myself and Chris Novembrino kind of doing a lazy river of wrestling criticism, going through the news and whatever happened in stateside television wrestling. And also, you know what? Sometimes we just like to watch old stuff and talk about that, too. Love for you to give us a listen. If you haven't already, we are Shake Them Ropes here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. You are listening to the flagship podcast with your hosts, Joe Lanza. Money. That's how you pronounce Rich, I want you to give me one. Money. Is it money? Money. 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 Not even, it's not money. Money. It's not Monet. It's money. 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 <laughs> money. 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 We, we have to pronounce things properly. Here. Oh, of we course. Never... Yeah, on this show. Yeah. We're not going to fuck around on this show. Money. 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 It's Money. Say it, Rich. Rich Crage. I'm Rockin' Rich. He's Jammin' Joe. We got a great show for you. Blake yeah. Jab and Chair Shot are here. Yeah. We're ding, 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 ding. We got yeah. like bells ringing and everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we are live on the flagship podcast. I am Rich. He is Joe. Joe, what's happening? How's, uh, how's 2024 treating you so far? I really, you got to get rid of that money. <laughs> That's the intro. last time. That. I promise it's the last time. This is is the one year anniversary. I was going through all of our old intros. I realized it, it, a year, just about a year to this day, is is when the money thing began. Uh, I just wanted it one more time for for the devoted listeners. I'm officially deleting the file because it is infuriating to listen to. It is so bad. But I, one few. last time, I, I got to let it go one last time, and now we can officially call it a day, I think. There are, there are a few things on this earth worse than that money intro. I mean, <laughs> the people love it, though, man. I don't know why. It Our people love it. I don't that. think new people love it. There's got to be somebody listening for the first time ever that is just like, what the fuck? I'm never listening to this again. But our people love it. And you know what? Our people always come first. I don't know if all yes. of our people like it. <laughs> Maybe not all of our people like it, but uh, I'll tell you, the, the chat room, when the, when the Monet thing starts, the chat room goes nuts. <laughs> people really love is. the yeah. Monet. Well, those are the, those are the hardcore <laughs> flagship freakazoids because they're, they're listening live. This isn't even the proper night. No. So, you know, of course they're going to enjoy it. You know, they, they, they enjoy all the hijinks. But uh, I, would, <laughs> I would wager that most people just saying, ah, I'm looking for a little wrestling talk. What's this? I don't know much about Killer Khan. Let me try these guys. X and right out. Why would why would you why would you tolerate that? Uh I mean it, it is very annoying. I, I I it's it's undeniable it's very annoying, but I think most other wrestling podcasts aren't very I, uh, I the I listened to a little bit of Busted Open today on my way uh, home from oh, work because I was I was getting kind of bored of my current serious lineup, yeah. so I decided to kind of scroll around a little bit, find out what else was going yeah. on uh, in the world, and I stumbled upon Busted Open. And I, I I rarely, rarely, rarely listen to Busted Open, so I was like, you know what? I'm in traffic. Nothing's going on. Let me see what uh, my boys Dave LaGreca and Bully Ray have to say uh, about the world of professional wrestling. And uh, let me tell you, they broke down All Japan's Mania X. Uh, I, I'm a little worried about our segment of covering, you know, Miyahara and, and Nakajima and, you know, Tamura versus Al Lindemann and stuff. They they nailed it. They they broke it down from as many angles. I mean, Bully Ray giving the real thoughts as a guy that was in the ring before. I mean, that's going to be tough to follow. So um, I think Rich is doing that sassy thing again. No, uh, <laughs> I don't think they broke that down at all. I don't Do you think, think they, they just uh, talked about The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, the entire time? I'm going to guess that was a. Uh, high priority topic for those guys, and they spent all. How long is that show? Two hours, three hours? Uh, I wouldn't know. I only listened about 15 minutes, to be fair. I was like, I think I got this. I think I got the gist of what we're doing if here. But if it's three hours, they probably did two hours and 45 minutes of The Rock and 15 minutes of uh, how can we fix AEW because it's always broken. <laughs> so that that was that was probably the uh, the show. But hey, you have to do a show for your audience, right? Hey, right. You have mm-hmm. to do a show. Mm-hmm. For your audience, but um, 
Yeah, I mean, do you want to do a half hour of ripping other wrestling podcasts? Because I have a, I have a list. Uh, no, can... no, 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 no. Okay. I'm good. No. All right, <laughs> you got a list. Um, <laughs> How extensive is this I list? Mean, let, hold on. Let's see. Let, let me. If you really want to do this, no. Rich, you'll be tugging your collar instantly. No, so. I think I would be. Yeah, I think I, I think I'd like okay. to avoid that if possible. So, uh, right. we got a lot to do this week. Even though we are here on a Tuesday, which if people are wondering what the hell are you doing here uh, on a Tuesday, uh, that is because Wrestle Kingdom is Thursday, and we're doing an instant reaction live for Wrestle Kingdom. It's gonna be available at patreoncom slash wrestling, voicesofwrestling.com slash patreon, or flagshippatreon.com. But uh, if you want to listen to that, that will be immediately after uh, Wrestle Kingdom 18 on. Thursday, so as a result, we didn't want to do a flagship that day. Not only because we have to get up at, at, at or I have to get up at a weird time, you'll just have to stay up. It's pretty much no different for you. To, it's business as usual for Joe Landa uh, on that day, but we figured doing a flagship on Thursday would be kind of stupid because one of the big topics we're going to talk about is Wrestle Kingdom, and it's like we're going to be reviewing it earlier in the day. We won't have an episode where we can preview it, so it just worked out to do this on Tuesday. So here we are on Tuesday. It ended up being a pretty big week. A uh, pretty big weekend for wrestling as well. So we have plenty to get to, plenty of topics uh, to discuss, even though it is on the short week since we just did a show on Thursday. But, of course, you will get that preview uh, of Wrestle Kingdom 18. That is coming later in the show. Uh, we are going to talk about, much uh, unlike our friends at uh, Busted Open, uh, they did not have time for uh, All Japan Pro Wrestling's Mania X uh, and Nakajima versus Miyahara, the Triple Crown match in the main event. But we have plenty of time for that, so we'll talk about that entire show uh, as well as review that main event match. It's getting a lot of match of the year buzz uh, as a late contender for 2023. Uh, we'll also touch on All Japan Pro Wrestling and WWE's ongoing relationship, which seems to have even more um, uh, smoke to the fire, I guess is probably the best way to put it. So we'll talk uh, touch on that a little bit. Uh, we'll also do some wrestling contract season news as, as some new people have also... Uh, sprung up recently as as appearing to you know be leaving their current place to go to a new place or an old place or a familiar place so a lot of movement going on in the wrestling contract season world uh we are going to briefly touch on kota bushi's ankles as well as the uh, noah the new year show uh that took place uh, last night uh featuring the main event of kota bushi and and, and now michimira fuji which is currently at a 0.58 on cage match so uh yeah that's going to be one definitely to talk about and then of course we much like our friends at Bustin' Open, are going to talk about The Rock uh, returning to WWE on, on the day one Raw show uh, and said he wanted to sit at the head of the table. So uh, some interesting stuff there. Will Cody be able to finish his story this year? How does The Rock factor in WrestleMania? How does Roman get involved in all that? So, uh, again, we will talk about The Rock uh, returning to WWE. Uh, but before we do any of that, though, we do have to... Uh, Start the show off. We have to keep punching up on other podcasts because we can go over what the Ringer show has talked about. <laughs> no, 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 no. All right, come on. That's punching up. That's still pun- that counts as punching up, right? It's the Ringer. That's true. We Listen, like to punch up, right? I, I consulted okay. a man who I consulted a man. Uh, remember when we, we were doing our Ringer wrestling podcast? Yes, yes. For a few for a few weeks there, about a year ago or whatever it was. Uh, I consulted a very wise man on uh, on the rules of, of of when we would come off, you know, a little uncouth if we continued doing those type of bits. And uh, that man was friend of the show Murder Brian. And you know what Murder Brian told me, Rich? He told me as long as we keep it to the ringer and bust it open, it will it will count as punching up, and we can't get into trouble. That was straight from Murder Brian. Well, there you go. And yeah, and that's was... that. That guy is the professor of punching up, man. That guy spends all of his podcast right. times banging on Mad Cow and all these dudes all across the world, all these you know radio superstars of yesteryear that are still currently hanging on or whatever. Yeah, if he says it, he's the master. So okay, that makes me feel a lot better about uh, making fun of the ringer and bust it open. Then no one punches up like Murder <laughs> no, Brian. he is the no. master of he... it. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else would be, you know, punching down or punching sideways. We don't want to do that, you know, and, and get ourselves into trouble. Uh, so let's see what the ringer's been up to. Okay. You, you filled this in on busted open. So it's not like we have a million topics to get to, including the Wrestle Kingdom preview, which used to take up the entire three hour show. We had a four so, hour uh, show. We once had a four hour show for the, uh, the Tanahashi Okada right. match. We did four hours on one on Wrestle Kingdom <laughs> with, I believe, two and a half hours simply on Okada and Tanahashi. And now we're like, yeah, ah, so we'll let, get wait, to wait, it wait. when we get to it. <laughs> let, let's burn 40 minutes on the ringer here. So let's see. We got uh, uh, Wednesday Worldwide. Their last episode was on December 27th. Here's what they did on their show, Rich. This was, uh, of course, all the stars, Ben, Kyle, and Brian. Mm -hmm. No last names. No last names. (laughs) Just Ben. They went over. 
Just <laughs> it's bad. All the stars. It's bad. <laughs> all the all the ringer stars. Um, they discussed the biggest wrestling headlines ah. from 2023. Uh, they each picked their own headline. Okay, that they wanted to discuss on the show. Are you ready for each of the selections? Okay, so these are the biggest wrestling stories of 2023, right? In the opinion of <laughs> Ben, ben <laughs> Carl, and Brian. Got it. Okay. Ben selected WWE sold to Endeavor. Great. That's a pretty that, good big that, topic. That's, ben? You nailed listen, it there. Ben, That's a pretty big topic. A, a transformative change uh, in 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 the top wrestling company in the world, uh, leaving the family business and 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 merging with the top fighting uh, organization in in the world in UFC. Yeah, I would say that that would be uh, a pretty big wrestling story for 2023. Ben, not bad. N- nicely done. Nicely done, Ben. Brian selected Mercedes Monet joins New Japan Pro Wrestling. What do you think of that? Who uh, uh, was that? That big? Not I mean, terrible. Not I mean, terrible. It, I mean, that's like a good. Like it was big in. I think at the time. Yeah, the right. Time. Big in like January and February, but by March it was not that big. Then by April it wasn't that big, and then by the summer after she got hurt, it was basically not big at all. And then I think at the end of the year, people kind of. So I don't, I don't know. I think that was that was an early. If you looked at a, a graph, if you were graphing the biggest stories of the year, I think Monday showing up in in New Japan early in the year. I would be high in that graph, but then it would I, I think it would probably fall pretty uh, significantly by the end of the year. So um, I don't know if I would call it the, one of the biggest stories of 2023, but a big story. I can't, I can't hate Brian too much on that one. Well, listen, we're two for two. We're two for two. You got to consider you can't copy another guy's story, right? Because you're all picking one. So uh, keep that in mind, too. All right, here's Carl. Carl selects. CW acquires the rights to NXT. Oh, <laughs> my God. Uh, I mean, it was, yeah, I mean, it's a story. I don't know if it's the, the biggest story Just of 2023. Bury it if you want to bury it, Rich. If you want to bury no, see, it. No, see, but I believe, you know. so I wrote something all about that. I wrote something all about how significant that, that that deal was, and it was, uh, to me, a big sign that NXT, after, you know, being down in the dumps from AEW, just destroying them on Wednesdays and moving to Tuesdays and having to rebuild the entire show or whatever to get to this level where they get on the CW network and get a TV deal. I mean, that's a, that's a story. Uh, the biggest story of 2023, that's that's pretty absurd. In a year that had, uh, I don't know, Terry Funk died. And <laughs> again, Vince McMahon yeah. officially ousted from power. And I feel like you could double dip on the uh, WWE uh, it merges with the UFC to form a new company. I, I know that that's maybe uncouth for a, a, a thing well, to do. Well, one of them the, picked that. Right. One I think you could too. That. That's a pretty big story. That's one the all-time pick- biggest story right. in like, wrestling history, right? Well, you know, Rich, I did see that the Fightful Award nominees oh. dropped this week. Okay, chosen by the uh, not the Fightful staff. Now it's they 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 call they do a public culling of ah, okay. the uh, nominees, and then like the top seven nominees in each category are what goes up to vote. And they had their top pro wrestling story of the year, and I can tell you that the uh, TKO thing was not one of the top seven. Mm. I can tell you that Terry Funk passing away was not one of the mm. top seven. However, the return of TNA did make the cut. Oh, the, uh, <laughs> I was there live the for that moment. Awards. Yeah, what a so, uh, you'll always remember where you were when uh, Scott Demore said TNA is fucking back. <laughs> it's like, all right, cool. Yes. Uh, all right, you're more excited than I am, but sure, TNA is back. Great. Um, okay, yeah, that, that's one. The, is is CM Punk uh, returning to two different companies in a single given year uh, on this list? There was a uh, a punk story did make the cut. Yeah, it was the brawl in slash fired from AEW or okay. something. So yes, yeah, CM. The point is yes, CM Punk did make the uh, did not make the ringer cut though. No, uh, I was apparently. surprised. Yeah, no, nothing like the CW so, <laughs> NXT network. Right. But uh, sure, okay. All right. So uh, okay, we're moving on to the Masked Man show with Kaz, which uh, dropped on December twenty eighth. Uh, they are back during the holiday season to give you all the content you need in wrestling this week. Oh, great. People don't need us because, as you can see, uh, the masked man and Kaz are giving everyone all the cut. They're catching you up on the entire week, Rich. So uh, here's what they discussed. Uh, CM Punk returning to Madison Square Garden. Definitely a viable topic, yeah, I would for sure, say. Sure, sure. Uh, one that we covered. Uh, the guys discussed the rumors that WWE is looking to lock down Cody Rhodes on a long-term okay. deal. Okay, that sounds also like our viable. show. Yeah, we absolutely. did that show last week. Absolutely. Yeah, no doubt about it. And topic number three was later, 
the guys preview world's end. That sounds like our That's show. That's kind of our show. Say. Yeah. Now, <laughs> now let they, me tell you, it's probably they're stealing a, our they're stuff. Probably, they're stealing our bits. Probably a, a terrible version of our show. Let's be honest. I mean, it was probably awful compared to our show, but I got to tell you, I, I can't, there's no angle for me to rip the uh, masked man show this week. I think they did a nice job there, but if you're looking to rip things, Rich, there's always cheap heat. And that's next on the docket. Of course, that's our pal Dopey Pete. <laughs> Dopey Pete. And, uh, What's up, Dopey Pete? How are you? They did They did two shows. We've got December 29th, the the uh, the Cheap Heat with uh, Dopey Pete, of course, and uh, Stack Guy Greg and Dip. Love my and guy, Dip. And they discussed. Here's the topics. Oh, this is a far cry from uh, Masked Man Show. Topic one. Hall of Fame induction speculation. Oh. <laughs> I don't even know what that okay. means. Like, what are they, they, hold on. Hold, hold, hold on a minute. In the year, the, the month of, what are we talking? This this released in December of 2023, right? Three days ago. The Three 29th days ago. or something. Okay. Yeah. They're discussing ago, who is going to go to the WWE Hall of Fame uh, in hold on, April hold on. of 2024. Hold on now. Let's be fair doesn't say it just says hall of fame what, what hall of fame do you think dopey pete is talking about the rock and roll hall of fame you think he's talking about the rock and roll hall of fame maybe maybe the impact hall of fame maybe the impact know. maybe the nw nba hall of fame the maybe they think the observer does induction speeches oh, they i'm know sure dopey pete in. i'm sure dopey pete is sitting down and talking about the observer yes maybe he vote maybe he's excited about rock and perez how do you know that's true he could have voted for him. He's a New York guy. He's, he's a New York guy, too. Yeah, he's a New York guy. So, you, you know, maybe sitting on his uh, grandfather's lap learning about uh, Rock and Perez. Yeah, it's, it's possible. Number two, fantasy booking the Rock's return. Mm. Hey, that was prophetic. He hadn't returned yet. Oh, wow. Yeah, actually, hold on. You got to hand it to him. You get Listen, like ISIS, sometimes you got to hand it to Dopey. You got to hand it to Dopey right. Pete. He nailed it. Okay. Uh, uh, next up, uh, Rosenberg's backstage experience at the house show at MSG. They'll put themselves over there, maybe. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, and then the CM Punk match with uh, with Dirty Dom at the house show. Stay mage and happy new year. So that was uh, the – the but, but but wait, there's more. There's one more cheap heat. This came out today. This cheap heat came out today, and we've got uh, – Can't knock the, the work ethic. Surprise. Can't knock the work ethic, no. honestly. Two, no, two listen, pods in no, four days is pretty good. Out. Pumping them out. The Rock's appearance on Raw, of course. Uh, then, and I'm just reading this verbatim. Next topic was the Cody Rhodes of it all. I guess what we're going to talk about yeah. tonight, right? Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. what happens to Cody. Uh, MJF's prolific AEW title run comes to an end. Again, legit. Yeah, yeah, it's fair. I guess that's their 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 world's end review. I know, Rich, that you don't always have your finger on the pulse of the world of cheap heat, but I'm going to fill you in. Dopey Pete generally will only review like and talk about MJF. It's this bizarre thing. Like the rest of the company seemingly doesn't exist. So I'm not surprised that their 12 minute and 47 second review of the show is just talking about MJF's uh, title run coming to an end. Uh, final topic, Rosenberg's tales from Rio de Janeiro. Oh, so maybe did he see an IC title change there? You know, Pat Patterson maybe won a tournament while he was down there or something. That's okay. Um, that's fine. You know, that's like a vacation. That's a vacation style segment. So I can't, I can't knock him for that. Sounds yeah, like a, it looks know, like a lovely place. Um, Good for him. In totality, I have to say, um, the spontaneous bury the ringer bit didn't really work out. There's not a lot to bury. They did okay here. here. The I mean, hall, I, dis- like earnestly it, discussing who's going to go to the WWE Hall of Fame in January. Uh, 2023 is pretty ridiculous, but um, yeah, not bad, not bad. Not, not even who's going in. Like it just says the in, who's going to do the induct. Oh yeah, Hall of Fame induct. You're right, Hall of Fame induction speculation. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know. I guess they 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 let off with that too. They let off. That's with that. That that's was dicey. Topic. That that's dicey. That but uh, other than that, other than that, and having what a 16 minute World's End review, uh, we went two and a half hours for the record over there at uh, flagshippatreon.com. Flagshippatreon.com. Uh, MJF. It was a MJF epilogue. It was like. Discussing his mm. title reign coming to an end. So to give, uh, I, I want to be fair to bust it open. I'll read the rev- uh, the uh, description from today's show, just in case. Because I, like okay. I said, I did not listen to the entire show. But uh, here's what it says. 
Uh, Busted Open, The Rock has come back to WWE. Dave LeGrecker and Bully Ray discuss the return of The Rock on Monday Night Raw. Is he targeting the head of the table, Roman Reigns? What does this mean for WrestleMania 40? And what's next for Cody Rhodes? So that's all. I, I, I like mean, you, you said, know. I'm positive. That's all they talked about today. So I, Sounds like it, you know. But uh, that's their audience, man. Yeah, that's go for it. That's their audience, you know. Wish I had their audience, but uh, hey, one day. You, uh, you can, you can, you know. You can lead your audience too. You can, you can, as long as what you're, as long as what you're, is you're interested in what you're talking about, you know, the, if the audience likes you, they'll be interested too. So, which is why we torture them with NWA yeah. discussion. Mm-hmm. You know, much the then, chagrin of everybody who goes, no, oh God. <laughs> like, <laughs> and they ask for it now. You know, they're, so, yeah, they're gluttons they, for punishment. There was a while where they remind like, oh, us half the time. No, we'll talk about blank or oh, just watch Joshi instead of NWA. We're like, no, we got to cover the NWA. Every, nobody else will talk about it. If we don't, who else? Uh, it's kind of been our motto. That was our motto throughout 2023. A lot of stuff. If not us, who? You know, MLW, the world of MLW, NWA. No one else will possibly do that. And uh, you know, I think that leads perfectly into this uh, discussion that we're going to do at the beginning of the show here. Uh, talk about the life uh, and career of Killer Khan, who um, you know passed away uh, just a couple of days ago at age seventy six. And unfortunately, one of the things that I noticed throughout everyone, you know, there were a bunch of posts about him, a bunch of things all over the place. Every single one of them said WWE superstar Killer Khan, and that I don't know about you, but that just annoyed the hell out of me. I know why people do it, I get it, but it, it, it speaks to your point that if you lead an audience in a certain way, if you let them kind of dictate all of wrestling, and all of wrestling is seen through the WWE lens. That's just the way people are going to see it, and I just I don't know if you if it bothered you as much as it bothered me. I just didn't like seeing WWE superstar Killer Khan or former WWE superstar Killer Khan uh, passes away. I mean, this is a dude who had you know quadrupled the amount of matches in New Japan that he had in WWE. The guy who who started wrestling in 1971, retired in 1987, was all over the territories, all Japan, New Japan, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, he had a, he had a run in WWF, no doubt about it. He had a very significant run in WWF, but I just, I don't know, to me it just bothered me to see the headline of WWE Superstar Killer Khan passes away. I was like, ah, that just seems like, again, why does everything have to be through the lens of WWE when, when a guy had such more of a, so much more of a rich history in, in wrestling than just simply WWE? Well, I mean, his career goes all the way back to the JWA. I mean, we're talking about a guy who uh, predates New Japan when his career started, Masashi Ozawa, before he took on the Killer Khan gimmick, which I believe was Carl Gotch's idea. Yes, yes, it was. You know, he was, you know, and, and he did, he actually had two pretty significant runs with the WWF that we'll talk about, but it's interesting because, um, really the Vince McMahon version of WWF history, they kind of erase the first one, which is interesting. And I guess I'll save that for later when we get to it also, because really Vince McMahon's version of history starts with 1984. We all know that, you know, the way he tells the history of the company, it starts with 1984 and every now and then they'll reference Bruno. That's basically right. Vince's version of the history of the company. You might get a snook, uh, you might get snook that. off the, uh, you know, a real quick snook of thing. You might get back well, in the ring anyway, waving. Yeah, yeah not anymore. anymore. <laughs> These days, uh, not anymore. But yeah, you might, sometimes yeah. we get the snook of thing. You get Backlund maybe, you know, zipping his jacket, unzipping his jacket. You get a quick Bruno thing and then basically Hogan drops the leg and, and, and now history has begun. Well, you know, just to, to tell you what I'm talking about. I mean, when, when Killer Khan came back to the WWF in 1987 for his second run after, you know, five years away, you know, four or five years away, whatever it was, which isn't a significant amount of time. I mean, you're talking, you know, that would be like somebody who left WWE. It'd be like Cody coming back to WWE and pretending he had never been there and they, they didn't know who he was. You know, he came back and in his first match on TV, you know, Vince McMahon and, and, and uh, and Jesse Ventura are going on and on about this. Who is this man that Mr. Fuji has discovered? And Jesse's like, look at this guy, Mac man. I can't believe this man. Look at the size of this man. <laughs> you know, uh, I can't. Like, you, you, what, what, I wonder what he brings to. It's like he was there four years ago. He's a he's a wrestling superstar who's main evented all over the world. But the first run, you know, in, in 81, 82, it, it, it was wiped from. The history books. It never happened because nothing happened except for Bruno uh, or maybe superstar Billy Graham or like you're saying, maybe Bob before 1984. So, um, you know, but yeah, he did have the two. But yeah, 
he started with the JW. He goes all the way back before he predates yeah. New Japan. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, he ended up with New Japan and he was a underneath babyface for a number of years wrestling under his uh, his shoot name. And then uh, that's when Carl Gotch suggested based on, uh, you know, wrestling at the time. And we always have this same conversation. You know, a lot of younger fans probably don't understand this, but, you know, Carl Gotch's idea was that, you know, because he was on his way, he was going to try to uh, make it in America because his career was going OK in Japan. But, the, you know, the territories were still thriving at that time. And um, he was going to make a pit stop in Mexico and then move on and try to make it in the territories. And Gotch's idea was to take on an over the top gimmick because Gotch felt that in America there was a lot of anti-Asian sentiment coming off the Vietnam War, coming off World War Two. And, you know, that's no surprise. There were there were heeled Japanese wrestlers in every territory in the country. I mean, this wasn't like some kind of super novel idea that Gotch had. It was really just common sense. But what Ozawa came up with was uh, a Mongolian gimmick, you know, Killer Khan. And he, he, he worked it out in Mexico first, which is something that um, many Japanese wrestlers have done. They've gone to Mexico and worked out new gimmicks. I mean, Tetsuya Naito is a perfect example. I mean... The whole, you know, the whole Los and Gobber no place yeah. thing. You got hooked up with those guys, and you know, everyone knows that. Shinsuke Nakamura, and, you know, Shinsuke Nakamura went there. You know, as, great left as the straight lace, you know, pseudo MMA fighter, a Nokiaism guy, and came back as what you know Shinsuke Nakamura as today, what he's been now for the last fifteen years. You know, that that completely transformed his character in the same way. So yeah, two of the two of the biggest stars in New Japan, and and, and two of the biggest Perfect Japanese example. stars of the last twenty years. You know, went to Mexico, completely transformed themselves, and came back as as completely different reworked wrestlers that that ended up being the main events and, and two of the biggest stars Hiromu too yeah i mean you mm-hmm. know the kamatachi was it kamatachi oh uh, yeah was yeah it? kamatachi or was kamatachi el desperado no 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 kamatachi uh, was, no, uh, was was kamatachi was kamatachi was Hiromu. yeah you know and that basically was was essentially the the version 1.0 of what would become Hiromu takahashi you know was was kamatachi as, as another recent example but it was the same thing so he decided to go with a Mongolian gimmick. Now, Mongolian gimmicks, again, that wasn't anything that was completely reinventing the wheel. You know, you had, you know, the Mongolian Stomper or the Mongols. There were plenty of Mongolian gimmicks in wrestling, and and, and none of them were actually Mongolian. <laughs> no, <laughs> like, never. never. You know, so, so, so he works out. That's, you know, he took Gotcha's suggestion and decided to, to uh, take on an over-the-top uh, Asian persona, and he went with the Mongolian thing. And he was El Mongol in Mexico and then uh, went to the United States, uh, worked it out, fleshed out the gimmick and became Killer Khan. And really from there, you know, all throughout the 80s, um, in, in a career very similar, I would say it was very similar to when we talked about Kamala. You know, he would he would come into a territory as a monster heel and he would uh, almost in every case immediately work with the top guys and go to the top of the card and work a program with whoever the top guy was and not stick and not overstay his welcome. You know, he'd stay four or five, six months, seven months, you know, 10 months tops. And then it was off to the next spot. You know, he, he mid South, you know, he'd go to mid South, mid South and work. he worked with Jim. He worked with uh, Ted DiBiase in mid South. He worked with DiBiase in Georgia. He worked with Mr. Olympia in mid South, uh, you know, always, always at or near the top. And, it wasn't long before he made his way to the WWF in late 1980. And again, almost immediately he comes in and he's working TV squashes to get over. And at this time he's managed by Blassie on the second run. He'd be managed by Mr. Fuji, but on this 1980 run, he was managed by Fred Blassie. And within, I don't know, two months of debuting, he's working Madison square garden with Bob Backlund. Yeah, it's actually, so, so it's not even too much. This, this, how quickly, WF moved at that time. We always talk about that with Hulk Hogan, where people don't really realize with Hulk Hogan that like when he came back and and, and Vince McMahon Jr. decided this guy's gonna be my star, he didn't build a guy up for two years to get him his star. He was like, No, this guy's my star. And within like a couple months, he was there. Killer Khan was wrestling Bob Backlin. He debuts his debut for WF is December 17th, 1980. December 29th, he's facing Bob Backlin for the WF title on MSG. The same month. <laughs> it's wild. Yeah, so, you know, he comes in 1980, and they immediately put him with Backlund, which really was the early pattern. You know, he did the same thing in Mid-South, in Georgia, immediately working at the top. And then 
You know, he was also working with Pedro Morales and, of course, Andre the Giant. And in 81, they did the angle in Boston where Killer Khan, because the finisher he would use is he would jump off the middle turnbuckle and do the knee drop to the throat, right? And what happened was they, they did an angle where Killer Khan broke Andre the Giant's ankle in Boston. Now, what really happened was Andre injured himself getting out of bed. He broke his ankle rolling out of bed in the morning, but they decided, all right, well, let's, you're, he was already in this feud with Killer Khan. So they decided to, you know, make lemonade out of chicken shit to create my own phrase there and try to make some money off of it. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if Andre, I guess he worked the, the match, which was more of an angle than a match with the broken ankle. And they had Killer Khan put him out. And then, you know, they built to Andre's return. And I know they did a big angle that I've watched a million times on TV too, where Andre came out on the crutches and Vince McMahon, you know, those old style from those days where Vince would be in front of the ring yes. and the wrestler yeah, yeah, yeah. would come out and they'd do the, you know, and Andre came out on the crutches and Blassie came out to confront him and, and, and then killer Con And then Andre, he waxed Blassie with the, with the crutch. If I'm remembering this right, exactly. Like across the throat. Yep. Mm-hmm. And then I think killer Khan comes out to attack him. Um, but anyway, they had a series of rematches. They had uh, Mongolian stretcher matches or whatever they were called. And the most famous of which was in the Philadelphia Spectrum. That one is all over YouTube. You can find it. Yeah, that one I, fi- I watched earlier. That. Not hard to find at all. Very, very easy to find. Yeah. Yeah. And and in that one, and I'm sure all the matches on the loop were very similar. You know, he, he drapes Andre's leg in the ropes like he did in Boston and comes off and to kind of recreate the broken ankle. And... um you know, Andre makes the big comeback and eventually it's just basically a, stre- a stretcher match. You know, you get the guy has to be carried out on the stretcher. So um, he puts Andre on this little tiny stretcher. Oh, the tiniest <laughs> little be- fucking stretcher. Yeah, it's yeah. it's he it's, not, it's not the modern WWE stretcher thing or whatever. It, it's like no, it's, it's like a piece of steel with like three red straps below it or whatever. They're trying to roll Andre onto this thing. And it's it looks like it's going to be tough to do it no matter what. And Khan's no small guy either. I mean, that, it looked like it barely fit him either. So, um, yeah, it's it's, it's, it's pretty hilarious. Too, cause it's, it's McMahon on commentary, right? I think it's McMahon. Yes. Uh-huh, and, uh-huh, um, yeah. I don't think it's Dick Graham. I no, no, no. It's, it's definitely sometimes it's, it's, did Philly. Yeah, it's definitely Vince. It's definitely Vince. Yeah, and he and he, no, 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 he knows the stretch was small because he's insecure about it because he he I don't know if you heard this, but he's like you see that stretcher reinforced by steel for these large bodies. It's a tiny stretcher, you know, <laughs> right, right. Reinforced by steel. It was right. definitely just a cheap aluminum stretcher, you know, but, um, but yeah, so Andre then, you know, won those stretcher matches all over the loop in the big cities. I'm sure they did one in Boston too, you know, because, you know, the spot of the, uh, the original injury. And, you know, it's funny because um, uh, on Khan's second run, when he came back in 87, he did world title matches with Hogan in Boston and Philly and the Boston match outdrew the Philly match by like four or 5,000 fans. And I think the Boston Mongolian stretcher match with Andre outdrew the Philly Mongolian stretcher match by about three or 4,000 fans. So you could see the power of the original angle taking place in Boston that kept killer Khan's drawing power alive in that city for like the next five years. Right. Right. Because you know, so, you know, because those fans remember, oh, he's the guy who took out Andre the Giant. I, I got to fucking get a load of this guy, you know? So, um, yes, yeah, so he's a top guy. He worked with all three of the top guys. He worked with Backlund, 19,000 in MSG, he worked with Andre all over the loop. And, he, and in between, he worked with Pedro, who was the Pedro Morales, who was the Intercontinental Champion at the time, all over. And, you know, he stuck until about 82. That was really a really long run for him, you know, for him to be in a place from the end of 1980 into 1982 uh, was a pretty significant run. And, you know, he would, and Watts would always take him back in mid South and he would always come in for a short while. He would never stay long at all. And he would always work with the top guys. And then he finally started bouncing back into new Japan in the early eighties. But this time he came back as a heel as killer Khan, you know, and, and he worked with, you know, the top heel group with, with you know Ricky Choshu and Yatsu and all those guys and 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 Animal Hamaguchi, which is funny because then when he went back to the states, and I'll, I'll talk about some of that that stuff in '84, 
when he went back to Japan, that's when Choshu and those guys had jumped. So he went back when he went back to Japan, he went back to all Japan. He didn't come back to New Japan right, right. after 84 because th- th- that whole group, Yatsu and Choshu and Hamaguchi and all those dudes, uh, while he was gone, they had all jumped to all Japan. So he, when he went back to Japan, he went back to all Japan with his boys, but um, he comes back to America in 84. And this is where he has uh, two of his most interesting runs. He goes up to Calgary and again, immediately works with the top guys. He's infused with uh, Archie, the Stomper, Goldie, and Dynamite Kid for for the top titles. And that was sort of the pattern of his entire career. No matter where he went, they immediately booked him to the top. He worked with the top guys in almost all these territories. And then, uh, you know, he'd be, he'd be gone in six months. And from there, he went to Dallas. And that's where he had arguably... W- I, it's probably not more famous than the Andre stuff, but I don't know what Andre match you would pick. I guess you would pick the match where he broke his ankle, but that wasn't really a match. So you, you could make an argument. It was in Dallas where he had his most famous match, at least among hardcore smarks. And that was the Texas death match with Terry Gordy. Right. Which, which you did this week for your match of the week as my match of the week. Yeah. So that's the one I chose. Um, look, he comes into Dallas in i guess the spring of eight let me get my timelines right yeah it would be the spring of 84 after the calgary run after you know he worked with the top guys in calgary he was done there and he came to dallas for the first time he had never worked dallas before and dallas was still they they hadn't completely cooled off yet this wasn't the super hot period okay this isn't 82 83 but it also isn't 88 you know what i mean like it's still a, a pretty viable territory at this time um so he comes in in early 84 and th- this was such a great storyline that they did. So he comes in as Terry Gordy's buddy, right? And Terry Gordy introduces him to the rest of the Freebirds, And they're like, all right, this guy seems like he's a fucking animal. We'll, we'll, we'll you know, he could help us against the Von Erics. You know what I mean? Like uh, no problem. So he's Gordy's pal and the Freebirds accept him. So he's, he's working with the free birds to, to battle the Von Erics and, and, and battle all the baby faces in the promotion. And um, what they do is Skandar Akbar pays off killer Khan to join devastation incorporated with the missing link and one man gang. And I think wild bill Irwin was, was there at the time. So he pays off killer Khan who takes the money and then killer Khan helps them jump the, the other two free birds. So now Gordy feels responsible for this, right? And there's this great promo, and I think you could find this on YouTube as well, where Bill Mercer is in a parking lot outside of the Freebirds van. And yes, it's exactly what you would what a, <laughs> yes. what a van <laughs> right. that you think the Freebirds would would ride around in in 1984. You just know it's carpeted. You don't even want to know the debauchery that probably took place in that thing, okay? With various women in the North Texas area. But uh, who knows what drugs were done in that thing, what sex was happening. But Mercer knocks on the door of the van because he's got to get comments from the Freebirds. Terry Gordy comes first. First, Hayes comes out. Yeah, what do you want, Bill Mercer? Yeah. Then Gordy comes busting out of the van. Don't you put your hands on the Freebirds van. Who do you think you are, Bill Mercer? And let me tell you something, Killer Khan. I trusted you. And then you attacked my brothers. And nobody attacks my brothers. And then this crazy motherfucker starts taking back bumps on the concrete in the parking lot. He rips his shirt off. He's doing like, you know, the Ric Flair gimmick where he's like elbow and elbow dropping his own. Oh, of course. Yeah, yeah, back yeah. Bumps in the... But Gordy's doing this in like on the blacktop. He's like doing it in a in, in the middle of the day in the summer. In fuck, it's probably 110 degrees. The, the 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 concrete's probably 180 degrees. He's taking back bumps without his shirt. If you want, if anybody co- wants to watch this episode, it is uh, the World Class Championship Wrestling number 136 from August 4th, 1984. I believe that is on Peacock and and on the WWE Network. If you do want to find it uh, there, just yeah. just just was able to locate it. So 136, if you want to uh, find it out. Ah, oh, it's such a great promo because and, and and while he's doing this, he's just talking shit about Killer Khan and how he can't wait to get his hands on this motherfucker. Because he put his hands on his brothers. Because the Freebirds considered themselves brothers. You know? And you could hear Michael Hayes 
He's like, chill out, Terry, chill out. He's like, chill out, brother. You know? <laughs> right. it's, it's, it's just so great. You know, Bill Mercer played his part so well. So uh, that was the setup for the feud. And uh, now keep in mind, the Freebirds are still heels. Okay. So this is like a heel versus heel feud because Killer Khan joined the other big heel stable. You know, he joined Akbar. And meanwhile, you know, Khan is still at war with the, with, uh, with the baby, he's still at war with the Von Erics and Iceman King Parsons, who was a baby face at that time. I know he turned constant. That guy turned as much as Big Show and Sammy Guevara, you know, to give people a frame of reference. Uh, you know, uh, Chris Adams, you know, all the baby faces. So uh, Khan is is with Devastation Inc. still feuding with those dudes. The Freebirds are still feuding with the Von Erics. But while this is all going on, they're building to these Terry Gordy uh killer con singles matches and and you know con he wrestled michael hayes he wrestled buddy roberts and then finally they got him in there with terry gordy and they peaked the feud at the uh at the thanksgiving uh star wars uh in 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 on uh, thanksgiving 1984 where they had their texas death match mm-hmm. and that was the match of the week this week on the site and the deal there was the special guest referee was Kerry von eric with the psychology being, look, Kerry Von Eric hates both of these guys. So he's going to call it down the middle. Like he's not going to have any favor because he doesn't like the free birds. He doesn't like devastation Inc. And the other thing it's the Von Eric's and everybody trusts the Von Eric's and they trust Kerry. He just won the America's title. So the idea was the fans trust the Von Eric's implicitly. They know Kerry's going to call it down the middle. Cause he doesn't like either one of them anyway. And this is one of the legendary, world-class matches of that hot period with Terry Gordy and Killer Khan. If you want to watch it, I've got it up as the match of the week on our $5 tier. It's on YouTube, but you get the write-up if if you watch it with us uh, behind our paywall. And it's just, uh, it's just a blood fest. I mean, both guys are, you know, Gordy's busted open very quickly. And, um, you know, he, I think, uh, let's see, I think Khan wins the first fall with the knee drop off the, off the turnbuckle. And then Gordy went, and, and it's Texas death. So it's, uh, uh, you have to pin the man. Then there's a 30 second respite. And then after the 30 seconds, you have to answer the 10 count, right? So Khan hits the knee drop, but Gordy answers the 10 count. Then Gordy hits Khan with a pile driver. And they built to that so well, but Khan answers the count. So they've got one fall on each other each, but neither guy could keep the other down. And the finish of this match is so good because Gordy gets Khan with the Oriental Spike. Killer Khan taught Terry Gordy the Oriental Spike. That was the story. When when Gordy brought Khan in to team with him, because they worked a bunch of tag matches together away from the rest of the Freebirds, you know, Battle and the Von Erics. Killer Khan taught Terry Gordy this, this Oriental Spike, this mysterious move from the Orient, right? That, that everybody feared Killer Khan's Oriental Spike. And it came back to bite Killer Khan because he taught it to Gordy. And then Gordy used it to beat him in the Texas death match. So he uses the Oriental spike on him. It's very clear that Khan's not going to be able to answer the bell. So at the count of eight, Skandar Akbar and a missing link hit the ring. Because they're like, ah, well, he's not going to get up. So we have to figure out a way to, to get him out of this. So then uh, Carrie, and, Carrie Von Erich and Terry Gordy are fighting off uh, Akbar and the missing link. The fucking crowd's going insane. Because this is the Von Erics and the Freebirds fighting together, right? This is like, oh, shit. They've been waiting for this for like two years. Right, right. Yeah, so after, were, after the, the hated feud, obviously, the, the one that everybody knows. Still that, feuding. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, but the fact that they're, you know, at least for this brief moment, coming together for, for, for at least uh, a shared enemy uh, in Killer Khan is pretty cool to watch. Yeah. And Khan's been, you know, and Khan was wreaking havoc in the whole territory. He put Chick Donovan out of action. I remember that angle where, you know, he destroyed Chick Donovan and, and uh, and, he, and and Kevin Von Eric was seeking revenge for Chick Donovan at one point. This was just all very well done, and it's it was all over the course of of maybe five or six months. And then uh, so anyway, they run off uh, the heels, and then Kerry grabs the mic, and uh, in his typical Kerry dumb jock fashion, he's like, "Well, you know, uh, I was the referee here." His marble mouth. I was the I was the referee it, over there. It is, it is my opinion. As the referee, that I had reached the count of seven, 
and I don't think Killer Khan was going to get to his feet, so I declare Terry Gordy the winner. Right? The crowd <laughs> which is not fair. fucking nuts. <laughs> which is not right? fair at all. That's, that's bullshit. I, I, I disagree. I think it's very fair because he wasn't going to get up. So Terry was like, like fuck this shit. I'm not going to let Skandar Akbar pull this nonsense. I'm, I'm, I'm declaring I'm the referee. I'm declaring a winner here. So uh, crowd goes nuts, offers his hand to Terry Gordy. Right. And and Terry's so, so great here. He's covered in blood. And he sh- you see him shaking his head no. And his, that big mop, that head of hair is going side to side with the blood and the sweat flying off. And you can see him saying, I'm yeah, not they don't doing make it, him, They don't make him like Terry Gordy, man. There, there's no one else. You'll never be another Terry Gordy. That look? Yeah. Nah, no one else can do that. No one else got I'm that look. I'm not doing it, Kerry. I'm not doing it, Kerry. You know, he's like, I'm not doing it. So Kerry gives him the double hand wave. He's like, all right, fuck you. Like, he double hand waves him, and he and he's, he he leaves. He's like, all right, I gave him a chance. And then Gordy grabs the mic. And like, hey, you wait a minute there, Kerry Von Eric. You get your ass back in here, you know? And uh, everyone thinks he's calling him in the fight. You know the Von Erics, they're never going to turn down a fight in Dallas. So Kerry turns around. He's like, all right, he gets back in there. He's ready. Got them fists balled up. And then Terry puts out the hand, right? And then they shake it out. Crowd fucking explodes. Reunion Arena. 16,000 people, right? Terry Gordy and Kerry Von Eric shaking hands in the middle of the ring, both covered in blood after they ran off Killer Khan and Devastation Inc., Pro wrestling, Rich. That is pro, That's wrestling, pro man. wrestling, man. That's it. I'm, I'm surprised. You said you said there were sixteen thousand people there. Uh, they were all stuffed into a guard armory, or you're, you're saying the because I I was under the impression that Vince McMahon uh, for WrestleMania was the first time that you know took wrestling from you know smoky guard armories into big arenas with bright lights and stuff. But you're telling me sixteen thousand people were at the reunion arena for this show in 1984. Fifteen thousand three twenty five hmm. in Reunion Arena in Dallas, and this is when they were starting to cool off. Yeah, right. This is their down period. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now they weren't. Now they were still the listen, beginning of the know. down. The beginning of the down period, yeah. we should say, just because it wasn't, wasn't what their, they were. It wasn't Texas Stadium. Period. They weren't filling Texas Stadium like they were a couple years ago. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, they were still running it. I think uh, um, they had run. They they ran Star Wars there the next month on Christmas, and you know, there were still, and they ran the Cotton Bowl um, in. October of that year. Um, and that, you know, I let me see if I could find that. They ran, I don't even remember. Okay, so they ran the Cotton Bowl on October 27th, about a month earlier, and they drew 12,000, which that's a basketball arena crowd. That's not a football stadium crowd. But um, what was on top? Six man tag team titles, the Von Ericks versus Jake Roberts, Chris Adams, and Gino Hernandez. I do appreciate, um, though, that uh, somebody on Cage Match put capacity 12,000 for the Cotton Bowl in Dallas. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I, I don't think CA means capacity. I think that's German for for um, attendance or something. Oh, like that. okay. I don't okay. think. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that's what the CA means. Because the next year it's a CA 26,000. So they, uh, they, right, they were able right, to get right. yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's funny if it would have been, but. Um, but yes, yeah, so that was that Star Wars show which drew over fifteen thousand, and you know I know Chris Adams and Kevin Von Erich was on that show because uh, I think Chris Adams turned heel at some point. Yeah, mm-hmm, uh, that's exactly all of that. And and you know, but those were the two big matches. It was Chris Adams and Kevin Von Erich, and it was uh, Terry Gordy and Killer Khan. The Texas Death Match was a match that uh, people still talk about to this day, and and. You know, I know Cage Match has it at six point four zero, which will come out to like three and a quarter. That's a notebook match. No, I, it's I, you know, I that. just it's better than that. Obviously, I just watched that again this week, but that's one of the most memorable matches of the era. That's easily a four star match. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Even with modern eyes, I mean, um, you know, that's just uh, it's just an awesome, awesome match. The great post match angle, and then again, you know. Um, that was it for Killer Khan. I mean, he he they did one blow off. They did the cage match at the Sportatorium a couple of weeks later, where Gordy beats him again. And um, I know that they they I think Chick Donovan even gave him his comeuppance in a couple of different matches in in, in tags or whatnot for for putting him out earlier in the year. And then Killer Khan was on the move again. You know, it's it's again he he rarely other than that first WWF run from eighty to eighty two. This is what he would do. He'd come in, he would headline, 
And then, you know, because what do you do after at that point? You know, once that Gordy feud, he came in and that was the program from start to finish. Right. Which, which we need to bring back to so, wrestling. And I know it probably will never come back, but this is when I think it, it, it really is the best. Because like you said, you do the feud and you have the blow off match. And instead of like, all right, now we need to figure out something else for this guy or a new thing to do or we'll just run it back again. The guy leaves and the guy goes to another territory and can do the somewhat of the same thing, but a little bit different with new people like this should happen more in wrestling. Like, I think all of wrestling should embrace the idea of people leaving and they can come back. It doesn't mean they're they're gone forever. We saw we're going to talk about it with Killer Khan here in a minute of him coming back and and, and coming and going from WWF and coming and going to all Japan and coming and going to different territories. But I love that idea of a guy. You, you, nine months, ten months, you're done. You finish up your story and you leave, and you go and you go else somewhere else, and you tell a new story somewhere else. And if you want, you can come back. But I, I love that idea uh, in wrestling, and I think that's something that's a lost art in today's wrestling, where people are just there forever and ever and ever and ever, and it's it, it, it's it's a strain on them. It's a strain on on the on the bookers as well, and the and the writers to try to figure out what the hell to do with these people now that they're here. I think the indies would really, um, the indies in particular would really do well by, by kind of re-embracing this a little bit more. The, than, than... the problem is, is with the Indies, people live places right, and they right, got to right. work where they live. Right. And, and they're, know, and they're not going to be able to make money. No, 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 what beyond right. isn't going to be able to grab a guy from Chicago and say, Hey, come do nine months with us here in Boston. And uh, yeah, you'll be fine. You'll be able to make a living wage out here. Cause you're not going to be able to, right. you know, right. it's, not it's a chance. right. Yeah. So it's, it's a totally different thing, you know, but the, there's no reason it can't happen in the bigger promotions. And, I think, you know, you know what? We're going to talk about someone a little later where I, I think you're kind of seeing an example of, of what we're talking about here. But um, then he goes back to Japan, and we kind of talked about that already. All of his boys had jumped to All Japan. So he jumps – when he goes back to Japan, he jumps to All Japan with him. So he spent some time there. And then um, his next stop in America was the second run with the WWF that, that we kind of talked about earlier where they pretended that he had never been there before and that the storyline was – was uh the crafty Mr. Fuji had had found this this uh unhinged maniac in the Orient who was in here to you know and and it, and and it's so funny because they behaved as if this man never existed before even though it was the same name the same gimmick the same guy he was a worldwide wrestling star and all that and they even brought him in the same way that that Vince Sr brought him in in 1980 he beat a bunch of jobbers in you know a minute on TV and the same way they did in, back in 1980, and then he was immediately put into a program with the world champion. Right. right? Okay. So then they, they immediately – now what they did was he had a brief – after he beat some jobbers, he had a brief feud with Outback Jack. Right. I watched a few and, of those matches too. Those are readily available on, well, on YouTube two. and elsewhere. Yeah. yeah. There's, if you saw two, you saw both. So the first time he wrestled Outback Jack on TV, Outback Jack was still kind of sort of being pushed. OK, because it was still early enough in his run before they gave up on him because they gave up on Outback Jack almost instantly. OK, the thing with Outback Jack is this. If I if I could take a quick diversion, of course, they discovered Outback Jack in Australia. And at the time, the Crocodile Dundee movie was a cultural phenomenon in the United States. If you weren't around for the, for the you, you can't movie understand movies. the Australian obsession that was happening in, in yes. And it didn't, it, it lasted until Steve Irwin kind of kept it alive for a little bit longer in America yeah. too. So if you're, yeah. if you're, if you're under the age of 25, you might not get it, but if you're you, not going to get it, but if you are 25 or older, you remember that this country was obsessed with Australian things for, for about two decades or so. And it's all Paul Hogan's fault yes. for these Crocodile Dundee <laughs> yep. movies. So Vince sees this Australian guy, and he's he's fucking 6'6", 300 pounds. Peter Stillsbury, ah. right? Isn't yeah. it Stillsbury is his name? P P yeah, Pete Stillsbury, yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah, and you know, Vince, ah, I can have my own Crocodile Dundee. Ah, I can make some money. Right? So he brings the guy in, and what he does is he sends him to Calgary to train – with les thornton up in calgary because they had the working agreement with calgary and around that time from about 85 to 87 vince would take his projects send them up to calgary with les thornton let them work the calgary territory and work out their gimmicks so he sends this peter stillsbury up there to work on this paul hogan crocodile dundee gimmick is outback jack some other guys that were up there at the time ted rcd do you remember Ted R.C.? Of course. Though? He was a strong man. Yeah, yeah. The strong man gimmick. So he was there at that time. 
Uh, Bill Kazmaier, who again was another strongman gimmick, but I don't think McMahon sent Kazmaier. I think Kazmaier just happened to be in the territory, but he was there at the same. And WCW would bring in Bill Kazmaier a few years later, I think in 91. Yeah, 91. 91, or 91. 91 he was there, yeah. He's... Yeah, so um, he was another guy who did like strongman competitions, like our CD. But mm-hmm. Arcidi was WWF's guy. McMahon sent Arcidi up there. He sent Outback Jack. Dave Barbie, who is like forgotten to history, but he was a job guy in the in the early and mid-80s. And McMahon saw something in him. He sent him up to Calgary around that time. And by so, the way, Arcidi has the weirdest body you'll ever see in your entire life. If you don't know who Ted Arcidi is or what he looks like, look him up right now. He is the most ridiculous looking human thing you'll ever see a perfect representation of a, of an 80s strongman i would have pushed him too i i i would have done everything I, exactly like vince did i would have done whatever i could to get that guy pushed and, and you know people tried so hard with these strongmen and none of them worked out no. ted rcd didn't work out bill kazmaier didn't work out steve DeSalvo didn't work out Patera, none of them to a lesser out. extent and it's it's well patera was a huge star for in the set but yeah, after by the prison, time yes Aaron right 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 go. by the time but vince he, tried to get him back and was like no he's big and strong and big and it didn't yeah it didn't quite post prison patera right. was just a yeah um you know which gives people kind of a negative impression of he's part of those that whole group of guys who have that negative impression on a lot of fans of a certain age whether it's ken patera whether it's hacksaw jim duggan whether it's uh there's, there's a whole list of them of guys who were really good workers and big stars Coco. Coco's the one we always bring up, where people think of Coco as, like, the bird guy. And we're like, right. no, he's so much more. God damn it, he's so much more. Duggan, yeah, yeah, Duggan's yeah. the perfect one, though, because I – growing up, I just thought Jim Duggan was the guy who sticks his tongue out of the side of his mouth and goes, hey, yo, you know what I mean, <laughs> does a bunch of bullshit. And then going and watching, you know, Mid-South, you're like, holy shit, this guy's incredible. He's so good. But, yeah, it, it's – you get the impression that he's nothing more than, like, oh, hey. How's it going, guys? How you doing? You know, that's all he, he was. Which, to his credit, he was like, "Hey, I don't have to do anything and just like stick my thumb out and, and hold a two by four, and I'll be make a shit ton of money and not have to take any bumps." Sure, I'll do that. So, so credit to him. But yeah, it is uh, it's atrocious stuff in WF. It's that whole yeah, a, a big debate I remember like in grade school was was we we thought Jim Duggan was supposed to be mentally handicapped or something. Uh, we, yeah, I mean, it wasn't subtle. I, 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 I'm kind of with you. I think as that's a kid, it was confu- yeah. <laughs> as a child, it was confusing. Like we used a different word that you can't use anymore, but that's what we thought. Like the, the, what he was supposed to be, right? Like that's you know, and he had this whole career as like a legitimate tough guy wrestler before that that you don't discover until you're an adult. You know, he's also and huge Kemper too. Kara. When you watch when you watch Duggan in Mid South, you're like, God, guy's a fucking monster. He's so big, but he goes to WF, and they're all monsters. I mean, he just looks like a normal sized person in WF. Yeah, but right. You watch him yeah, in Mid South, and gets too. these like yeah. normal guys. And you're like, Holy fuck, Jim Duggan's like uh, Jake Roberts is that way too. Jake Roberts is a monster in Mid South. He's so big, but then you see him in the WF, and he's like, you know, skinny, you know, mid card guy that's like, you know, half the size of most of the main eventers or whatever. But yeah, you watch him in Mid South, and he's just massive, massive, massive stuff. But well, Jake never had the physique. No, no. He 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 got roided up at first in like '86. He had that. He started to. He had some traps and some uh, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. some shoulders and right. But he quickly gave up. Like he got off the juice and he just went back to his lanky frame. He always had the height though. Remember the, the big thing was him at WrestleMania going nose to nose with the Undertaker when people really realized how tall he was. You know that one WrestleMania on the way out. His his eggs. His uh his uh write off when he lost to the Undertaker at WrestleMania whatever that was that was eight, seven eight eight eight, eight, eight. eight. WrestleMania eight and people talk about that to this day because they're like holy shit he's like a little taller than me he's like an inch taller than yeah the yeah, oh, yeah, you know? yeah yeah and and now now and then they put him with Lance Archer and it's like why not put fucking someone small with Lance Archer not. Like Lance Archer's the tallest guy in AEW, but you put him with the other tallest guy in <laughs> right. AEW. It Jake make Roberts any is sense. like two inches shorter than him now because he's bending over and he's old or whatever. But yeah, he's right. huge. Yeah, it, you know, which never made sense. You know, put him with Mark Sterling or something so he looks like the monster that he is. But anyway, um, none of that that those guys that got sent up that like none of them worked out. Like Ted R. C. D. didn't work out. He stuck around for like a year, but he was the shits. Dave Barbie came back and he was still a jobber. Like they couldn't get anything out of him. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting a couple guys, but um, Outback Jack and he was another one. They bring him back and he gets this huge push. They he's got these vignettes where he's in the fucking 
Bush, you know, like oh, they're like so eighties and so canceled. Like they're they're you couldn't do any of these anymore because he's the most generic ass Australian guy ever. He's driving a jeep, he's drinking Fosters. You know what I mean? It's like every possible stereotype. Yeah. I, mean, I don't think it's cancelable. Well, but there's some other stuff too. If you if you see that, he talks about uh, he talks about the Aborigines a lot. In yes, his promos, yes he does. which I yes. don't know if you can do those anymore. Those... He says he learns from them and learns how to hunt and. Yeah. Yeah, survive. yeah, all kinds of. Yeah, I, don't, yeah, I don't think uh, you can do those anymore. Yeah, but. A little collar tugging, I guess. Yeah, but um, <laughs> you guess. <laughs> so he gets this huge push with these vignettes and everything, and almost immediately, it's obvious to everyone oh, he that he fucking stinks. Okay, and he's got the theme, Tommy Kangaroo down, like this awful theme music, <laughs> like it's just <laughs> with the bazoombas and the. <laughs> Time you, kangaroo down, sport. Time you kangaroo down. Do you remember down, where they said he was know? from? Uh, I know you know from, this. Uh, I, I will think of it. Yeah, you know that they had like Bruce Pritchard work on this. Like Bruce, find the oh, yeah. dumbest city in Australia. That's where yeah. he's from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember it now. Yeah, <laughs> he's from Humpty Doo, Australia. I don't know what uh, yes. I don't know what region uh, Humpty Doo is. Uh, maybe I don't know the t- I don't know my territories of Australia very it's well. The, but uh, it's in the northern territory. Oh, I, oh, that's where the vignettes were. That's right. So yeah, he's from Humpty yeah, Doo, yeah. and he stinks. And, and unlike unlike Tacula, Mexico, it's a real place. <laughs> right. it's a cool- it's he also cool looked Mexico, like shit. He also looked like shit too. He came out and you're like, of all the guys in this company that all look these certain ways, here's this like kind of fat dude. He's kind of old looking. He's kind of hairy. It's it's not great. It's pretty bad. Well, he, he was big. Yeah, but he was like the I don't know. He was That's all he had. He was big. He was you know, thick. He, he, I would call him, I think he was thick. He wasn't I don't know if he was big, but he stuck. He was Yeah, he was uh he is terrible. He didn't what well, you know, but um they realized it very quick and they brought in killer Khan and that was his first feud circling back to the matches. You said you watched the first one Khan just attacks him before the bell spits the mist in his face and just fucking kills him. And the mat and it's, it's not even a match. Yes. Right? For those wondering, he spit mist then, at people. Cause you know, yeah, that was part the, of his gimmick. The yeah, Orient. Missed, so. <laughs> the Orient. So he also did um, the uh, the current uh, Great Okan, uh, the the yelling and and like kind of the banshee screaming while well, he's well, wrestling. Yeah, you too. know, I'm glad you brought that up because that's clearly where the Great Okan mm-hmm. is drawing the inspiration, because that high pitched squeal that the Great Okan does is what Killer Khan was known for. You know, and and the Great Okan is is very clearly borrowing heavily. Oh yeah, from Killer Khan. And we haven't really had, like I said, the Mongolian gimmicks were pretty commonplace in wrestling for a long time. But we haven't really had them in between Killer Khan and the Great Okan. You know, there there really weren't many, if any. And the Great Okan brought it back. Now, I understand Great Okan, I think, is supposed to be like a uh, some kind of based on some real Chinese myth or something. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. let's face it. It's 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 a Mongolian. It's, it's a Mongolian gimmick. That's exactly what it is based on these other Mongolian gimmicks. He does that same high pitched, like it's kind of scary that squeal that Killer Khan would do when he was chopping people. Yeah, Great Khan. I'm glad I would have forgot the I would have forgot to bring him up, but he's clearly the next step in the evolution of these Mongolian gimmicks. And and the other thing, Killer Khan really, you know, the the old Nez Pro Wrestling game, you know, King Corn Karn, I believe the character's yep, name was. Mm-hmm. That's that's Killer Khan. I mean, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. It was Killer Khan. It looked like Killer Khan. He did his moves. He spit the mist. Like, it was fucking Killer Khan. Like, fighter Hayabusa was Antonio Inoki. There's no question about it. Fucking looked just like him. He did the back brain kick. You know, he did the fucking Enzigari. And and King Corn Karn was fucking Killer Khan. Like, there's no debate. There's no disputing it, you know? Like, some of the others in that game, like King Slender... Who was the one who did the double-handed claw, like with King Slender, right? Like uh, man, see, like, you probably played more of the, the NES Pro Wrestling than I did. I, I didn't play much I think it's King of it. You, like, you could argue Hulk that that was drawn from inspiration of Hogan or Kevin right, Von right, Eric right, or, right. You got Fighter Hayabusa, who again, like you said, one hundred percent is that's absolutely Anoki. that's Anoki. Million King percent. King Corn. Uh, King Ken Corn Karn, uh, who does King the Mongolian Karn, chop yeah. and the karate kick. They say he's from Korea, but the man's he's wearing a Mongolian hat. He's clearly. 
uh, Killer Khan. And he spits the mist right. in the game, too, I think. So it's like he's he's fucking Killer Khan. Right. Then there's the Amazon who's just... He's this like a monster. Yeah, he's like Swamp Thing or whatever. Starman, who's obviously just its own thing. And then there's... What is it? Giant Panther and... Uh, Starman. So Starman was basically any masked high-flying wrestler because he did the coolest moves in the game. Right. You know, so... Hailed from then, Mexico, uh, question mark? <laughs> That's my favorite part of the entire game. Is there a yeah. Mexico, yeah. question mark? And then I think it was... it was You said it was King Slender who is kind of just like an amalgamation of, like, American wrestlers. I don't think he's really one guy. Yeah, you could say Hogan, Kerry, Ric Flair maybe with yeah, the hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Giant and, Panther, you know, who's, again, I don't, I don't really know similar. what... Just kind of yeah. an amalgamation of, like, five different major American wrestlers all stuffed into one. And then the final boss of the game was was a Tiger Mask ripoff. So he looked just like Tiger Mask, but... Yeah, Great Puma, right? He, Wasn't it Great Puma? Great Puma, yeah. yeah that's it. That's it. Great Puma. I guess I played more and for wrestling moved- than I thought. I just don't remember who uh, who uh, the the Panther and 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 what's his face Sun- Slender was supposed to be, but but essentially yeah, like basically you said. American stars at the time, right? You know, all um, and um, they're they're basically Peter Brand from Moneyball. They're a combination of people, but um, they yeah the the final boss was he looked like just like Tiger Mask, but he didn't do Tiger Mask moves. His gimmick was he did everybody's moves in the game. Like, he had everybody else's move. Let me tell you something about Nez Pro Wrestling. That's, like, kind of playable today, 30 years later. It's not bad. It holds up pretty good. It's shockingly playable. Like, especially compared to the other wrestling games at the time, like tag team wrestling. Oh, the rest of the wrestling games absolutely fucking suck. For, like, another decade, the wrestling games stink. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Go back and play them. They're terrible. Up until you get into, you know, the WF Raws and that that era and, and, and whatnot. A lot of the other ones absolutely stink there. Right? Obviously, you have WrestleFest in the, in the arcades or whatever, but most of the home games, your LJNs, your Acclaim, you know, wrestling games, absolutely terrible. This game was made in, like, 1985. Everyone has their own set of moves. Everyone has their own specialty move. Like, that, it doesn't sound special today, but go play Tecmo World Wrestling or Tag Team Wrestling or something. Those games are horrendous. Yeah, play the Super early WrestleMania. W- go play Super WrestleMania where everybody has the same moves. Every single person has the same moves and everybody, yeah. look, and everybody looks the same. So it's like, well, why am I playing as this guy or versus this or, guy? Or play that brutal, res- the first WrestleMania. Play that brutal game yeah, with oh, Bam God. Bam. And Ho- yeah. Like, you know, that te- that game is like, I'm telling you, like, if people, it's playable. It's playable today. Like, you'll get bored after an hour, but it's playable. But uh, but anyway, yeah, that to show you Killer Khan and what a star he was, he he clearly inspired that, you know, now infamous video game character. So anyway, I'm finally going to get through this Outback Jack. So he beats Outback Jack the second time in a squash, <laughs> right? So that's it for Outback Jack. Outback Jack has like one more little feud with Frenchie Martin, of all people, on primetime wrestling. Um, and that was it. After that, it was job duty for him. Did he but go anywhere Khan, afterwards? I don't even remember him going anywhere no, afterwards. Career ended. That was it. He was done. He was yeah. done. Wow. He didn't even try. Yeah, he, he just was like, "That's it." Well, <laughs> yeah. he got chased out of the business because everybody hated him. That's the other thing. Um, Dynamite Kid was brutal to this man. Wow. I don't know if you know the story. I this don't know if I do. For, we might save it for his for Outback's obituary. I know that sounds morbid, but uh, uh, like Dynamite was horrible. Like they would. In, they would coax him into getting into drinking contests because it's the eighties and they would spike his drinks and knock him out. And then they would just do unspeakable things to the man. I mean, they just dynamite was awful. What a like, cool dynamite guy. Was awful what a cool guy that dynamite but, kid was. Yeah. What a cool dude. But um, the other thing was, you know, there's, you, there's a lot of Outback Jack shoots from the modern day and he comes across like the most pleasant man. I think it was a combination of two things. He was just a normal, nice guy, which was never going to fly. In yeah, he looked around and said, room. I'm good. <laughs> this is, I'm getting out of well, this no, they thing. No, they looked oh, they, at him they, and they thought. they pride on him, yeah. Why are you normal? Like, so they didn't like him because he was just like. And the other thing is, when you hear other people talk about him, they say, yeah, well, he was a little boisterous about how he could drink people under the table. And he had this attitude because Vince told him he was going to make him a star. So I think it was a combination of. Who the fuck is this guy who Vince is pushing, who is terrible? And also, he was a little too normal to be a wrestler. And it was just a toxic mix. They all hated him. He got ribbed to death. And um, when they when they let him go, he just left the business. And But I tell you what, when you watch his shoots, he just is well-adjusted. He's a normal guy. He's very He comes across very nice. 
when I watch his shoot interviews, I'm like, I'm glad he got away from wrestling. He seems like a guy who it just wasn't, especially that era. He's better off. He probably lived a better life by not being involved in this bullshit. But, um, but anyway, yeah. Then killer Khan had, he worked Hogan all over the loop, you know, and world title matches right out of the gate. And, you know, once he finished up with Hogan and, and that, feud ran its course he left like he did all the other territories once he was done making the top money and he started moving down the card he was out of there but now his career was over that's it he retired that's it that 87 wwf run is it and um and why he's sort of forgotten is when you look at the luck he comes in right after wrestlemania 3 so he misses wrestlemania 3 right and then he leaves right before the survivor series so he never worked the pay-per-view. And as we talked about, remember we talked about this with Todd Martin? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. It, where it's like a lot of people learned their history by watching the VHS pay-per-view tapes. Right, we talked about with Orndorff. Orndorff just missed the cut on like a few of the biggest shows of all time. And instead was on he didn't, the well, quote-unquote biggest shows had... of all time that weren't on pay-per-view or whatever. That were you know just on, you know, not on VHSs or whatever. Well, yeah, well, Orndorff never got a WrestleMania match with Hogan, singles right. match. And if he did, he'd be remembered differently. Kamala. His singles match with Hogan. Kamala would Kamala's do the, all the loops, and then they would say, all right, time for Mania. Thanks, Kamala. <laughs> Appreciate it. Now we're going to go to Andre, and it's like, fuck, all right. Yeah, you go, look, Kamala doesn't work pay-per-views on those early WWF runs. He doesn't work them until the 90s. You know, and it's, um, you know, Kamala was Hogan's feud right around WrestleMania 3, but Andre got the WrestleMania match, and then... Killer Khan was the feud after WrestleMania three, but he didn't make it to Survivor Series. So he kind of falls in the cracks and gets lost to history because if you just are are if you're 30 years old and you weren't alive and you're catching up with your WWF history through the pay-per-views, Killer Khan doesn't exist. Kamala doesn't exist. You know what I mean? So it's like they got the short end of the stick. But make no mistake, he was a main eventer against Hogan his entire run. He worked on top, you know, and he made the big money and he got the fuck out. And, um, you know, it, it's 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 in that era where there was in, in 87, there was only two pay-per-views. So there's no SummerSlam or anything like that. And then, you know, it, it was harder to kind of fall through those pay-per-view cracks as the years moved on. And they started adding pay-per-view main events. But when you look at Killer Khan's career in totality, once he took on the gimmick, just about every place he went, instant main eventer and i'm not sure that people realize what a big star he was I, i'm not because he didn't make it past 87 he didn't make it to the monday night war the attitude era or even into the 90s at all so a lot of people came were born after he retired or came into fandom after he was gone but when you really go back and examine his career main eventer everywhere yeah in in north america for the entire decade of the 80s and just a, someone who I really am not sure if he's appreciated for the level of star that he was. So um, people may have wondered, ah, oh, they're going to do Killer Khan and give him the obit treatment? Yes. Look at this man's career. Look at his career. And then he owned that bar in Japan for the last 20 years or whatever, which anyone who travels to Japan will tell you that that was a hot place to go. He sing karaoke and everything. And this poor fucker died in his bar in front of all of his patrons. Yeah, so on, his on his his, his first bar uh, it actually closed down during COVID, and then he reopened it in March of this year, and and was you know again it was well you know people loved it. You always saw pictures. I always remember seeing pictures of guys there with with Killer Khan, and anytime somebody would come in there, I, I know there was there'd be like every time an American guy would come in, they would go there and, and, and get videos with him and stuff and old guys and young guys or whatever. So yeah, like you said, it sucks that that's how he passed away at his bar, you know, just, just collapses. And, and I think he has some sort of heart attack or some, some heart related issue. Uh, and just, yeah, that's, that's it. So that sucks. But yeah, that's, yeah. And he, well, I, I just want to, this is why I want to do this segment because I, I hated seeing WWE superstar killer con. Cause it's like, that does not, even remotely tell the story of what killer con is and you look at all these these you know news articles or whatever and it's like yeah killer con who uh, spent time in the world wrestling federation or whatever uh died, passed away it's and it's like ah man it's that's like an eighth of his career that you're talking about here and you, you, nobody else is going to be going as deep as we are to killer con here and then and, and he he absolutely deserves it because he was like you said a big big time star let me tell you something 
and we'll 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 end on this. First of all, that Terry Gordy match fucking rocks. Okay. And all that world class stuff, those tags with Gordy against the Von Erics, those tags with the missing link, who isn't exactly, you know, a super worker himself against the Von Erics, they're hot matches and they all end in these hot DQs because they didn't beat Killer Khan for a long time in that territory. You know, they wanted to preserve those losses till they mattered. And, you know, the Andre stuff is is hot. And th- there's a Hogan match. I think the one the one from Boston, okay? Because I know this because the Duke of Dorchester, Pete Doherty, is on commentary with Gorilla Monsoon, so it had to be Boston. I would recommend people watch that one. That is one of the better Hogan matches of the era. Okay? So you look at this guy, and he's a gimmick and everything. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that all of Killer Khan's matches were classics. Okay? And, you know, plenty of them were just... But, you know, you go back and watch some of this stuff, and there's a lot of really good shit there. He had an awesome match with Hogan in Boston, you know, and he re- he worked him in Philly. I'm not sure if I've seen that one. Um, I don't think he worked MSG with Hogan. I don't think he worked MSG with Hogan. But the Boston match is a kick-ass match. This guy wasn't, you know, he had excellent matches too, you know, and in, in, in he would drag guys into his style. And, you know, you look back at Hogan from that era, that seems to be the pattern. Terry Funk. Had a, had that had those great brawls with Hogan. Killer Khan had the great brawl with Hogan. You really had to get him to brawl with you during that era, and you can get a really good match out of him. You know, I think that um, Funk, Paul Orndorff had good matches with him, and those weren't really brawls. Those were just heated because the, the feud was so hot. Uh, Killer Khan had the great match with him in Boston. And some of the other guys, they'd be formulaic, and they weren't very good. You know, just the old beat him down for six minutes, do the Hulk up. Hit the hit the boot and the leg drop, you know those matches aren't so good. But um, I was very surprised when I watched the match from Boston this week. wasn't expecting much out of it, and it was way better than I thought it was going to be. So uh, there's good stuff out there with Killer Khan too. And we didn't talk a ton about his Japan stuff, but um, you know if you can find some of that, it, you know it's tricky now with New it Japan is, World. That's the thing. It's hard. Yeah, I, I don't know what's up on the new New Japan World. Let me let me check real quick. I know that uh, searching earlier today, there's a there's a ten room match. Uh, him and Tenru, it's it's not great. It, it's just kind of it's pretty slow moving. It's like that that era of all Japan that <clears throat> you know prior to the King's Road era stuff where it's hit or miss. You know what I mean? A lot of times it's very slow, and I'm sure it ended by with disqualification. I don't even remember how it ended, but you know I'm so I'm sure it ended with double dis- disqualification or double count on or whatever. Uh, as far as what's available, <clears throat> you know, on the current New Japan World, um. Unless there's a translation issue here, there is nothing available for him right yeah, now. Yeah, because they so. took everything down and they're slowly adding right, it back, right. and it, and that's a shame because you know I I really would have ate that up this week, you know, and 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 went back and watched a bunch of shit that I never saw, but um, you know, always a top guy, always in hot matches because of that, and I think that people will find if they go back and watch his stuff that it's probably better than you think it's going to be, in a lot of these cases. You know, but start with that Gordy match. It's just outstanding. Yeah, yeah. Especially, especially now that you know the backstory of the of the angle and the storyline. So um, there's actually, I'm, I was looking now. I think there's actually a Killer Con, Terry Gordy. Uh, somebody uploaded a a a whole story of the few a recap of the. Few, it is on YouTube. On YouTube, all right. Here's what you guys need to do before you watch. Gordy and Killer Khan. There's a video on YouTube from the Texas Wrestling Channel, and it, the title is Recap of Terry Gordy vs. Killer Khan, WCCW 1984. It takes you through the whole setup to the uh, to the Texas Death Match, including the van interview with Bill Mercer and the Freebirds. Oh, there you go. So, about. so there you go. You get that whole thing uh, on there. You get there's everything. You get, there's yep. one for the Hogan feud, too. Uh, I don't know if you see that one, too. If you look up uh, uh, Killer yeah, Con and Hulk yep. Hogan, mm-hmm. it's like a 38-minute video or whatever that um, that has all the promos and the matches or whatever. So definitely recommend checking that out, too. I think it has too. the Boston match. Yep. Mm-hmm. Has the whole build of the Hogan feud and the Boston match. You know, man. You know, when wrestling's good, it's so good. <laughs> it's the best. It's you the know, best. When it's good, when it's good. Nothing can stop it, and it, it, it's a shame. We say this every time that these guys have to die, but you know, you know, I, I, to, to really go in and, and rewatch a lot of this stuff. But um, man, I really, I, 
I really enjoyed going back and watching a lot of this killer con stuff that I hadn't seen before, you know, and I, and I came away thinking he's a lot better than I remembered. I knew he had the great Gordy match. Of course, everyone, well, I shouldn't say everyone, but a lot of people had seen that. And obviously I'd watched that before and some of the Hogan stuff, but you know, a lot of the Randy is type killer con into YouTube and just click everything. You know, you just take an hour out of your day and I discovered a lot of cool shit. So, um, Killer Khan. How old was he? 74? Uh, 78, I believe. Let me, maybe, uh, 76, 76. 76 years old. There you go. Uh, he lived a, lived, it seemed to live a, a pretty damn good full life. So at least there's, there's that. But um, yeah, no, it's just, uh, yeah, sucks. But yeah, dying at his bar is just the absolute. Yeah, I, just, I hated hearing that part. Brutal. Yeah. Brutal part of the yeah, story. I don't, I mean, I what don't a like terrible part, way to yeah. go. Yeah, don't I don't like any deaths, but uh, yeah, that one in particular. I mean, me we too. have people we know who have told the stories of listening to them to sing karaoke and everything else. Yeah, and didn't Jim Valley talk about um, going there? Yeah, that, I think he's got a picture with him and everything too. So, um, you know, singing karaoke with him and everything, and you know, so that was a big stop for wrestling fans and everything. His bar and for him to die in front of his customers and patrons—that's just crazy. Yeah, it absolutely sucks. But uh, there you go, Killer Khan uh, passed away at the age of seventy-six. We give you a lot, a lot of, a lot of. Things to watch. We'll try to link them in the show notes if not. But uh, if we do forget, though, pretty easy to find. Just search Killer Con on YouTube, like we said. The Terry Gordy thing, uh, the Hulk Hogan thing, I think, are, are, are good starting points. And, um, yeah, and obviously the match of the week this week on, on FlagshipPatreon.com if you want a little more. You know little- what else? Not, not a guy that had to have a title to be over. Nah. You know? he. You know, I I'm know not sure. I'm going to check if he ever won a title. I was looking at Cage Match earlier. I don't know no, if my went, man. I, well, he won the Stampede. He traded he, his – when he went to Stampede, with uh, the Stomper and Dynamite Kid, he had feuds with both of them for the Stampede title, so he definitely won that one. Um, so his entire Bill- run, he in 1979 was the Florida United States Tag Team Champion, but that that's really nothing. Mid South Louisiana Champion, Mid South Mississippi Champion, that was in both in 1982. Like you said, the Stampede won in '84, and then the World Class TV Title for 14 days. By the way, the combined reigns of all these: 17 days, 43 days, 26 days, 49 days, 14 days. And we would be remiss. The Andre feud, Observer feud of the year, 1981. Okay? Pro Wrestling Illustrated feud of the year, I believe, in 80 or 81. Probably 81. Are you on, the, are you on his uh, Wikipedia page? Uh, I can get back there. I just close it out, but I can, I can get right back to there. To give people the scope of that feud, it racked up every feud of the year award possible in 81. Yeah. The, the Andre feud. So... That match Pull isn't that bad either. That, that uh, for because if, if you have your idea of Andre as like WrestleMania three Andre or whatever WrestleMania four Andre, uh, he moves around pretty good in that Killer Con match. He, he he's still a little nimble at, at that time. So it's you know it's nineteen eighty one, definitely a little bit different. Yeah. yeah, definitely a lot a lot different than he'd be you know six seven years ago when his body's really starting to uh, uh, you know cave in on itself and just oh, really yeah. just eighty one eighty one. He Andre still moves. Can still move. Yeah. Yeah, so that was, I got it now. So it was feuded a year in the Observer in 81. It was feuded a year in PWI in 81. And the, I didn't know this, match of the year in 81 was the Andre match in May. with the Because Andre broke his ankle on May 1st, and then they had the match in Boston on May 2nd. And that one match of the year in Pro Wrestling Illustrated. So, you know, you can see the impact. And that's why that's one of the first things people think of when they think of Killer Khan is breaking right. Andre's ankle. Mm-hmm. You know, and that was that was a that that feud was a big deal, and that great those great that great angle with Freddie Blassie too. So, anyway, we got a lot to talk about. All right, so that is Killer Khan. Let's uh, move on to the world of WWE. Uh, the Rock is back. He returned to WWE on uh, the day one show last night on on Monday Night Raw. Uh, cut a promo against Jinder Mahal. Got over, did his usual The Rock stuff, uh, and then ended his promo by saying he wanted to sit. At the head of the table, which got people thinking, oh, boy, here we go. The Rock versus Roman. Is this for WrestleMania? Is this for the Elimination Chamber in Australia? What the hell is going to happen here? But he doesn't make that note unless they are going to at some point do The Rock versus Roman. So I ask you, Joe, when and where do they do this Rock versus Roman thing? Is this at Mania? It's got to be. I mean. Can't do this in Perth. Look. Australia, right? Well, you know. I saw a lot of people saying, please explain this to me because I don't get it. Okay. There's because we're like more and more disconnected with Twitter as the years pass. But there's this idea that there's allegedly some quote unquote cope from the WWE fans that maybe the rock match against Roman will be in Australia 
instead of WrestleMania. <laughs> why? Why wouldn't? No, but seriously, why wouldn't WWE fans want the biggest possible match that can be made in pro wrestling today to be at WrestleMania this year in Philadelphia? Why would they rather? Why is it cope? to say that they'd rather have it in Australia. Why don't they want the rock versus Roman? Wasn't that the whole point of the bloodline to begin with? And this the whole Roman point run? of the head of the table and the bloodline and all that shit, all of this, if you're wondering is all building up to the rock versus Roman, Roman Reigns. So yes. Why, why to rock it? So why wouldn't, why do, why are people saying the WWE fans don't want that at WrestleMania? The Cause, hardcore. Cause ones. they want Cody. They want Cody in that spot. That's preposterous. It's the rock. But they want they I want don't... one of their own, quote unquote. Okay. And, and the rock what... isn't their own. You know what I mean? Like because again, we talk this is a Are whole we... new generation of fans, man. I think there's a huge generation of fans that honestly don't really care about the rock and don't want the rock coming in to take uh... their spots. I told you that with I, I had people getting mad at me. Oh, oh. That CM Punk guy really ruined Randy Orton's moment. I'm like, what are you talking about? Whose moment? <laughs> Randy Orton's moment. CM Punk came out to WWE. That's a huge story. And those people would say, I, I, legit, a guy at my work was like, yeah, my wife was real pissed that uh, CM Punk, he, she doesn't really care about him. And he, he stole Randy Orton's moment. And I'm like, what? I think that's what we have here. Because, it, 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 again, you're right. You are right that The Rock is a bigger star than Cody. And if you're going to do The Rock and Roman, you got to do it at Mania. But those people want Cody because he's one of theirs. He's a WWE superstar. And The Rock is just a guy coming in from Hollywood to take spots. You, you had Cody last year. He lost. And you all said that that was the right. Well, call. yeah, but now they now they're really pot committed to it. This being the finish the story year. So then, if they don't finish no, the no, story no, no, this no, no. year, okay, no, no, they have no, no, no idea no, what no, they're no. doing. You, 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 you defended Cody losing. That's over. You lost. That is a whisper in the wind. By the way, he when you're saying you, you it's not me. When, you, when you're saying you, no, it's no, not no. me. You're, you're talking about you the, WWE the WWE universe. Man. Yes. <laughs> the ones saying that The Rock should wrestle in Perth are the ones I'm talking about. You had that, and you are the ones that argued with us and said that it was the right call for Cody to lose when we said Cody should have won because that would have made Roman's story stronger to have him lose the title and go crazy about it. And Roman and The Rock doesn't is doesn't need to be about a title it's about the head of the table it's about the family that's yes that's the heat so you don't you didn't need the title for that the fact that they did get the rock for this year in philly and make no mistake it's not going to be perth it's going to be philly it's <laughs> not doing it in right. philly. okay it's and not going to be on way, at the, like 2 p.m you know <laughs> eastern time on some random you know elimination chamber gonna, yeah yeah and 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 when The Rock was on college game day, not not like this week, the one earlier in the season. I don't know if you remember that one in Boulder. I think it was when they went to see Dion. Yeah, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. in Boulder. And they asked him about that, and he mentioned Philadelphia and the Liberty Bell and all this shit. He knew he that means he knew then, because he specifically mentioned Phil, WrestleMania being in Philly this year. And then the crowd all hooted, hooted and hollered. You know, he he was. So that's where they're doing. And that's where they should do it. You can't make a bigger match in pro wrestling today than Roman Reigns versus The Rock. It's the fucking Rock. And it's the what one that they wanted. Here? It's the one they've wanted for years and, and the then just never matched up. To. Yeah, it never matched up or worked. It's why Cody lost. Right. It's why Cody lost. It's why Sammy lost. It's why. Now, I would argue they didn't have to lose. You could have had Roman beat Sammy on Raw the next night. He doesn't lose any heat. You could have Cody beat Roman for those titles, and Roman doesn't lose any heat because now his story is the the table had the bloodline stuff. And you don't have to fake a, create a fake world title that no one cares about. Okay, you know. So I still think Cody should have won because the Roman Rock match loses nothing without those titles. Nothing. It's about the the family and the right. bloodline. And we, we've had those conversations a million times too that the idea that people are saying like, "Oh, you can have the Rock and Roman streak." That does nothing for anybody. You know what I mean? The, the Rock doesn't I'm need the, the Rock has to lose. <laughs> then he has to lose them back to something. <laughs> right, right. And, and he doesn't need that rub. The Rock doesn't need that rub. Dwayne Johnson doesn't need the rub of any Roman streak. That one's all about the tribal chief and head of the table and the family and the bloodline and all that sort of stuff. That absolutely did not need the titles. And, I, and that's what we said last year. 
year. We said go back to our instant reaction live uh, of WrestleMania when when Cody lost. We said none of this. This is all better if Cody wins this fucking title, and we're still on that. But I think those WWE fans then had to rationalize. No, 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 no. They're telling a very long story here. No, actually, Jay's the guy. No, no, no. I'm sorry. Solo's the guy. Wait, no, no, no. Now WrestleMania season's back. It's Cody. He's the guy again. We're that's right. It all makes sense now. And now they're gonna have to re-rationalize it again. And they're they're sick of doing that. Because they look like idiots. They look yeah. like buffoons for having to over and over, oh, let it play out, let it play out, let it rationalize. Because we remember at that moment, I thought, oh, my God, people are going to rake WWE over the coals for this thing. What a dumb idea. And that lasted about six hours, and everybody was like, ah, you know, maybe that is the right idea. This is actually not the right time. It's like, what? It's WrestleMania. <laughs> the guy just came back from injury, and he won the Royal Rumble, and he's over as fuck, and now he's in the main event of WrestleMania, and this isn't the right time? When's the fucking right time? And now we see... But those people had to rationalize it, so now I think they... Are, are trying to re-rationalize it again this year, and now they can't handle it that it's somehow not going to be that again, that somehow it's still going to be The Rock. You know what I mean? So I, I, I think... Um, Look. It's, it's yeah. It's... They... they the, the long-term story here was always, what, what year can we talk The Rock into doing this? That's it. So all this rationalization, and you know, they, they would talk themselves into whoever was next winning, and then they would see. But here's the thing. I think they lost a few people each step of the way. I think the Cody loss did lose. I think the bloodline story did lose some people when Sammy lost. I think it lost even more people when Cody lost. And I think the bad match against Jay at SummerSlam lost a a huge chunk of people who finally threw up their hands. I said, all right, this story stinks. Where, it's just about over. Here? Yeah, it, it, it's just about over. And, it doesn't and that's, feel hot. No, and, that's, and that's why I think a lot of people then sort of said, okay, 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 we get it. Because now Cody is going to quote unquote finish the story at Mania and then it's going to be over. And now they have to again <laughs> tackle the idea or, or rationalize the idea that, oh, wait, no, 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 no. This story is probably not over. It's only maybe even just beginning. You know what I mean? Because you're going to have. Because. The, the Jay thing, like you said, that was when it was like, okay, this is getting way long in the tooth. What are we doing here? There is no end in sight. You guys have no plan. You're just kind of doing the same thing over and over and over again. But then the and next we're running thing, out of people to feed them, right? But the next thing that you could look at the the oasis, you know, that you could look at in the middle of the desert, the 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 spot of land you could see in the middle of the sea was, oh wait, no, 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 we're gonna do Cody again at Mania, and then he's gonna beat him, and then all will be right. So now that that island is, is no longer in sight now it's like oh god we're, we're right back to this plus again i think the rock is considered an outsider to a lot of these fans a lot of these fans don't give a shit about the rock yeah i don't know the rock's the biggest star in the world i i, oh, I, no, I, I agree I think... with you. tell that to WWE, wwe universe fans that only consume wwe media i mean th- those are yeah, the people the you're rock, talking about the rock being in that match gets them attention from outlets that would, wouldn't have paid attention otherwise i mean that's just a fact so you know um, there's I've seen a lot of rock slander this week, and I I don't I don't understand it. Look, I get he's 54 years old; he's probably going to break his body in the match. Uh, th- the question is, does he win the Royal Rumble? Do they have him do Rumble and Mania? That's the question. I mean, if he can get him, they... yes. If he if he can do it and wants to do it and can stay healthy, yes. I would say for the purposes of the staying healthy. Uh, I would I would take him off of Rumble and just have well, why him. Why can't well why can't he come in at number twenty nine and not take a single bump? Um, I think you, I think you do wrestle a little bit with negative fan reaction if that happens. Mm, oh, that is yeah. You I know think you're what? getting a little bit of that if Batista he, thing. You're go you're going back and yeah. God, they've been so good. Oh, they do everything for yeah, their right, fans right. and the WWE universe. And everybody says about how oh they're not antagonistic to their fans anymore. I think if The Rock comes out at number twenty nine and, and clotheslines three guys over the top rope and and does a rock bottom to one guy and grabs him by the hair and tosses him out or whatever, I don't, I do not think the fans are going to love that because yeah, one of those guys is going to be. Punk, or one of those guys is going to be Cody, or one of those. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's going to. You can't have him throw those guys out. No. If he throws out Cody and Punk, they you're right, they could bowl him. But if all those guys are out already, you have to have the right heels in there for it to work. But you're right, it's too risky. It is too risky. You're right. I didn't think of that. But then, how do you get to the match? How do you from a story? Yeah. You know, because the Rumble winner has to have the match. Or you just do two matches. I guess you have this. You have the dope. Are they doing the dopey two nights again? They're doing two nights. They are, yeah. right? Yeah. So the Royal Rumble winner gets night one and the Rock gets night two, right? I mean, and not for the title. 
if you ass- table. if you assume that the guy in night one wins the title. So what are they whining about Cody for? He could win the Royal Rumble and, and get his match. He could. Why can't you do Cody Rody one night? Cody Rody. Cody Roman one night. <laughs> you could. And then do Roman Rock the next night. You could. Why can't you do that? Why can't you do Punk one night and, and Roman the next night? I mean, uh, the Rock. This is confusing. Everyone gets the idea. But um, do you think them wanting to extend Cody is like, all right, look, we're, we're – we're not doing it with Cody this year, obviously, because we have the rock. And then the third year, that's like the end of his contract. So do you think that's the selling point to Cody? Hey, look, if you don't extend, we can't ever do this. Right? Because yeah, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. That I mean, that's fuck, man. Twenty twenty five. You can't belt him up the next year and then he's done. Like, yeah. You can't belt him up. Right. Like that's the end of his deal. So it's like Maybe that's why they're trying to talk him into the extension, or maybe that's why they think they can get him with the extension. <laughs> we Sue Williams points out a great uh, thing in the note of chat room. says, you guys want Roman to wrestle twice in two days? What is he, a workhorse? That would quadruple his output from his, his normal yeah, pace right? for a year. Two matches in one, two nights? Jesus Christ. Here's what I want. Was he Ric Flair? Come on. I want what, whatever scenario annoys their fans. The yes, most. whatever That's we what could laugh at, whatever we can come yeah. onto our WrestleMania, our, our Royal Rumble instant reaction, which we're probably going to do this year, and our WrestleMania instant reaction, which we're definitely going to do. Whatever annoys those fans the most we can laugh at is what I want. So, Oh, you you, you guys are getting WWE instant reactions this year, so oh, put baby. your money where your fucking mouths are. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting those, baby. Not all of them. I did not no. agree to all of them. I'm not watching uh, yeah, well, <laughs> fucking worry, Judgment we're... Day or whatever the hell. We'll, we'll talk Rich into them. Don't worry about it. We'll talk him into them. Elimination yeah. Chamber at uh, We got corrected by, I think, somebody from Australia. 5 a.m. Eastern time. So you, they're going to put The Rock on <laughs> in Perth, Australia at 5 a.m. Eastern on yes, Peacock. Yeah, or, or Sorry, 6 a.m. Eastern uh, on Peacock, 5 Central. Um, that's not happening. Maybe the Rock's coming in for a killer con run. He's going to do six months here, right? Yeah, right. Show up at, you know, come in, work all the all the fucking shows on top. At his age, at his advanced age, well, look, it is now or never for him. Okay, um, I know he's in phenomenal shape, and you know he has phenomenal muscle is, definition. I don't, I don't know, right? And yes. that's almost a negative though, because that muscles tear when you're fifty. And you're on all kinds of substances oh, to acquire stop. those muscles. How dare you <laughs> accuse Dwayne The Rock Johnson of being on? That is a normal 52 year old man's body. I don't know what you're saying. Just you know, cod and and a little bit of <laughs> some bicep curls. I, I don't know, a little Joe. Cod oil, a little cod oil and gumption. <laughs> right. A little bit of you know, wakes up at 5 a.m. hits the you know bang clanging and banging in the weight room. That's all it is. It's just work. It's just hard work and a little bit of cod. Hard work, raw eggs, and creatine. Yeah, That's right, all. right. A little cre- Yeah, you, you know, know what? A little creatine, which is not illegal. Nothing creatine. against creatine, you know. So. No, you can walk into your GNC right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. Uh huh. And and do what the Rock does to acquire that physique. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. Look, I those muscles are going to tear right off his bone. We all know that. Okay. He 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 talks about the last match he had and how he hurt himself like three minutes in. And ripped it like an ab muscle, out. right? You know, you just, and cost you know. some Hollywood studio, you know, millions upon millions of dollars because they had delay d- delay the filming of a movie and pay everybody, all the production people, to to chill out yeah. and and not take another job. Hey, you can't. Sorry, you know, key grip. You can't take another job because when the rock is ready, we are going to do Hercules. But he's not ready right now, so you do need to be available. So here's my. I yeah. mean, this cost ungodly amounts of money just because he had to go in there and wrestle. You got to pay that second assistant gaffer to stick around <laughs> right, because you don't want that guy taking another you know, gig because you need him for when Hercules is ready to come back again. So yeah, it, it, that insane. guy's going. Hey, look, I, I, I'm supposed to be on the set of Knives Out. I got to go get more work here. You can't hold me forever, you know. So, but listen, I don't think that's a problem this time around because I don't think Black Adam Two is coming anytime uh, soon. No, so no, I think, and, and he can show up to the uh, United Football League's uh, opening nights uh, in a sling if worst comes to worst. So, by the way, the San Antonio Express just hired Wade Phillips. Oh, yes, baby. he's still alive. Oh, yes, wow. Yes, he's still alive. So, well, that be, is that How old is Wade? Or was he one of those guys that looked old always? I think he looked old always because he had the light-colored hair. Yeah. Um, but he's no young <laughs> But he's been coaching way. since, he's, yeah. I was like, I was like eight. No yeah, right. So, he, he's, he's been around for a while. Okay, good for son them. Son of a bum. At son of a bum on Twitter. He's is that what? Follow. It, wow, that's pretty good. Yeah. 
That's a good Twitter handle, son of a bum, because, you know, bum Phillips. Uh, he's 76 years old, Wade Phillips. 76 years old. So I'm seeing here that Heinz Ward was once the uh, head coach of the San Antonio team. Was he now? I guess. The San Antonio Brahmas. Brahmas, yeah. Heinz Ward resigned after finishing with a 3-7 and seven record in 2023. Hmm. So great, not not good. Yeah, did you watch any? I I watched zero seconds of the XFL or the USFL or the United Football, whatever the fuck. I I don't watch any of those. I don't know about you. Every time I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna get on the ground floor of this and I'm gonna follow. And then I watch one quarter and I'm like, this sucks. (laughs) Right? Secondary football is awful. It's always so bad. You know, like it's football, but the thing is, I can't. I don't know. Arena arena football was the only one that ever got me because at least it was different enough. But I also I was like ten when arena football got big, so I, I enjoyed it at that. I'm sure if I was. 36 like i am now and i watch arena football i'd be like what the fuck is going on here why are we bouncing things off this net what the hell is going on here so um yeah i i I watched like two minutes of the new xfl and i was like i don't really like nfl why would i watch this like because i thought the same thing i'm like "Ah, you know what i I need to get back to my football roots here and i was like i'm gonna get in on you know this yeah it's terrible yeah it's never i think between the xfl usfl and the aafl right they've had like eight combined seasons and like five of them finished yeah because covid fucked a bunch up some of them went out of business remember the aafl the, the, that yeah that they couldn't never make payroll finished. they had to get bought by somebody else just to finish their first season and then i'm not even sure if they even did i i think then covid happened and, and they didn't even finish it i don't even remember but the covid just really because everyone got on to the idea of spring football again right before covid and yeah. that kind of fucked everything up for these restarts, not that they're going to be sick. Look, do, you do know you... better than anyone the the history of these uh, oh, secondary yeah. leagues. It's no. never good. They're they're only there to be bought out by the NFL or something, or or, or right. able, you know. And now you got the live sports TV things. So they're just trying to get a, a whatever yeah. modicum yeah. of of live sports revenue Vince they could hustle. possibly that get. Was yeah. Vince's hustle, right. yeah, you know. It, so uh, they don't get a T te- like Vince. He didn't get a TV deal and he lost interest. Right. He's like, like fuck it. Fucking shit. You can take it. Yeah. Wasting my time. Do, do you ever get uh, caught up in uh, every time the, the great cup game is on, I end up like flipping over for a minute and I'm like, I don't want to watch this. Why do I care? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, I the, try, I try the, so hard. I just... know, the Macho Alouettes or whatever. And I'm like, Oh, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> and I watch like two minutes and I'm like, the fucking goal is in a weird place. And yeah, it, it's, it's all, yeah. I, don't... I always think I, I'm going to yeah, enjoy like, it. And yeah. I, I hate it. Yeah. It's terrible. Lincoln Park, I try hard, but I try so hard. But in the end, I, can't, <laughs> I just can't get yeah. into it. I yeah. just can't. Yeah. Right, that's The Rock. I'm sure uh, yep. we'll be dealing with him for the next uh, <laughs> at least three months, right? Three, four yeah, months. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He's, he'll be there till. I don't think he's finishing up in Perth at uh, 6 a.m. Hitting the rock bottom, slapping the guy on the chest, and then walking away back to you know Hollywood. I don't think that's happening. I think you know, you know, the rock coming back and getting booed out of buildings would be fun. Be I great. mean, I would enjoy that from a, and it'd be good for us to come on here and talk about. Mm-hmm. It. So, mm-hmm. if they're dopey new fans, you know, the guy we always talk about that likes to say yeet, but yet he's like an accountant during the week and has a fucking Labrador retriever. If he wants to boo the rock, I'm all about that. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Oh and, yeah, and, you know. A fun thing to talk about. So, yeah, it was great. It was yeah. great when Batista was coming back and getting booed during the Daniel Bryan Yes Movement stuff. That was great. That was great radio for us. So, yeah. I, hope... I don't mind The Rock coming back at all. I mean, I'm, I'm okay with this. You know, it'll be interesting. To <laughs> Rises watch. the whole tide, man. People watch. People care. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm down. Yeah. So, there you go. That right, is. Let's do some. Uh... You want to do a fake ad for the Patreon? Let's do a fake ad. Let's do a Patreon. fake ad, but it's also a real ad. Let's do it. Yeah. So. We have a Patreon, by the we way. Really we, we've talked about it before. It. <laughs> we didn't plan it, but we got it because we're pros here. FlagshipPatreon.com, Patreon.com slash Voices of Wrestling, and Voices of Wrestling.com slash Patreon is our Patreon. So we have Instant Reaction Lives is one of the things that we do that's the, probably the biggest thing that we do on the Patreon. We did one a couple of days ago for AEW World's End, so you can go and listen to that right now. Uh, that is in the archive. Uh, one of our all-time highest uh, listen to uh, Instant Reaction Lives. They, they, they keep, continue to grow. Uh, and that one was was one of the biggest where we talked about the devil and discussed all of the bullshit going in and around uh, AEW as well as a, a relatively decent show with some decent matches. But uh, talked about the ongoing rumors around Chris Jericho, uh, some information that we had heard about Keith Lee uh, as well as Andrade. And then, yeah, again, recapped and reviewed the entire show. 
We're also going to be doing that in a couple of days for Wrestle Kingdom 18. So when Wrestle Kingdom is done about, I don't know, what, 6 a.m. Central, 7 a.m. Eastern, somewhere in that rough area, we're going to go live on uh, FlagshipPatreon.com for Instant Reaction Live uh, for Wrestle Kingdom 18. So you're going to make sure you subscribe to the $10 tier uh, to get that. Don't miss a second of the show. So if you're listening to this now and you're interested in saying, hey, that sounds like good to me, uh, especially with the weird time, we would just recommend subscribing uh, right now or as soon as you possibly can. So that is at FlagshipPatreon.com. Uh, instant reaction live uh, as well as in december i uh posted yet another episode of the brett versus owen series uh covering the 30 year anniversary of the brett hart versus owen hart feud so we covered december of 1993 which included uh, a ton of really cool stuff uh, a ton of really great promos famous promos that that you may have heard of it's not so famous promos as well but we did a deep dive into the december of 1993 uh and Obviously, this is January of 2024, so we're going to dig into January of 1994 in that series. And that is, of course, the infamous Royal Rumble. Kick the leg out of the leg. The big turn against the Quebecers. That is coming up uh, this month on the Brett versus Owen series that I'm continuing to do. So make sure you subscribe to that. That is available on our $5 tier. Uh, that's where all of our bonus audio is. And then the Instant Reaction Lives and live shows and written content is all available on the $10 tier at uh, flagshippatreon.com. But, Joe, you had some stuff up there as well if you want to uh, plug away. I do. Um, yeah, so match of the week is back. I took Christmas week off. It was the Killer Con versus Terry Gordy match that I just talked about. If you haven't listened to the four-hour Eddie Gilbert uh, audio doc, which is part of the Jovember series, that obviously is uh, is getting uh, – people are still don't telling me how great it is. I, I, I thank everybody who's, who's praised it. Uh, I did put a lot of work into it, and I thought it was going to be good, um, but apparently – People seem to think it's even better than I thought it was going to be. So I'm 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 kind of flattered by all the praise that that's getting. There was one thing uh, I heard. That, I don't know if you saw this, but uh, the Observer Awards are are you can you can vote for the Observer Awards right now. And a lot of people said that they weren't sure what to do for best like wrestling documentary or whatever. It was like best ri- wrestling documentary or so. I, I forget the exact award category. And a few people on our Discord were saying, "Well, can we add you know Joe's Eddie Gilbert thing?" And I said, "Yeah, why not? It's a wrestling documentary." It's an audio documentary, but that's a documentary. It doesn't say it doesn't specifically say it needs to be a video documentary. So I say, fuck it, vote for the awards. If you're an Observer Award voter, vote the Eddie Gilbert a bit. All, all, all he can do is not count it, right? So, you know, if you want to send it in, send it in. I'm still hot that that one year where we really had a shot to win the book, the best book. Ah, we came in Brian seconds. Alvarez. I know. Fuck it, because Alvarez put a fucking book out. It was a weak year for books, so we had a real shot. And of course, and Alvarez, of course, is going to win. He could put out a book with blank pages and they're going to vote for him. And um, th- that would have been our chance to win a fucking Observer Award. Right. And it was the hundred, I, hundred things WWE fans should do or say or whatever yeah, before yeah. they die. And I was like, man, damn it. Come our on. And that was it. Because the other years, there were really great books out and it was a lot of competition. We always would finish like in the, you know, we'd get votes and be in the fucking issue. But that year, we really had a sh- If Alvarez hadn't put out a book, we would have won. won it. We would have won it. Yeah. We would have won it that year. I'm still hot about that. We would have, and, and believe me, I would have introduced myself as Wrestling Observer Newsletter Award winner, Joe Lanza, for the rest of my life. You know, so um, Roman Reigns can't win Wrestler of the Year, but I can win a fucking Observer Award. So um, I'm still hot about that. Yeah. You want to vote for the Gilbert thing? Go ahead. He probably won't count it, but. Uh, if it says Voices of Wrestling or Flagship, he might, though, because he counted the book all of those Yeah, years. of course. So, you know, maybe he would. You know, I would like to – that'd be funny if if it – you know, it's like Flagship Eddie Gilbert Doc, eight votes, like, you know, finishing 11th or something. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, I always get some newsletter. votes. It gets us in there. It gets us a little plug roost So, yeah, do it. Why not? And there hasn't been a whole lot of – it's not like – it's not like a year where we're being egregious with, like, oh, of course, everyone's going to vote for this documentary or whatever. It's been a whole lot of – Stuff coming out, it, but you know, WWE Network really hasn't done uh, anything like that, and I don't really recall any other big kind of documentaries or anything that came out. So yeah, fuck it, do it, vote it. Yeah. So the next November will be the Ultra Clash uh, review. Actually, the Go Home TV for Ultra Clash, the first TV without Gilbert, and um, the one that Todd Gordon had to do the emergency um, show with with uh, Jay Sully, the Go Home show where he announces that Gilbert's out. Well, it doesn't officially say Gilbert's out, but you know, announces all the changes to the card and then ultra clash. A lot of that's been recorded already. So those, will, those will be out soon. But um, yeah, anyway, that's the, uh, that's the Patreon where, uh, by the way, this is the end of the year. Um, 
by far our best year ever. Absolutely. So thank you, everybody. Thank you to everybody. I mean, it's just the the graph doesn't do anything but go up. So, um, you know, it, I want to thank everybody. I, I want to do even more. Uh, we mentioned joking around earlier, try to do some more instant reaction lives. Um, if we could ever get rich to quit this dopey job, we could really, you know, put our heads down and fucking barrel through the line and do all kinds of shit. So, but I want to thank everybody. It was a embarrassing numbers that we put up this year, um, you know, in, in a good way, uh, very flattering numbers. Um, so I want to thank everybody who subscribed and it just, uh, it keeps growing and it's not easy because not everyone keeps growing. It's, it's, it's not easy to deliver content that people want and are willing to pay for. And, um, you know, I, I just want to say that I appreciate the people who subscribe more than they even know. So, um, thank everybody and, uh, going to keep growing. So I want to have, I want to make the same speech next year on, uh, on, on the same show. So anyway, that's the Patreon rich contract season third week now i've got some more for you pithy thoughts as i run through yeah, these let's do it um i don't remember did we talk about money last week because... um not really there was there was there was still vagueness around money at that time but what, what do you got for this week now the word seems to be that she's aew bound and most of the uh reporters seem to agree on that so i think it's important for tony khan to win one here after punk you know, ends up with WWE and the rock comes back and Andrade who we're about to talk about is, is clearly on his way back. Uh, money was a key one and he had to do whatever it took to win that one. Because if she would have went to, it, it wouldn't mean anything like, like it doesn't mean AEW is going out of business or it's going to drastically affect their, but it, perception wise, it would have been a real bad look. He won Osprey. Then he lost a bunch and now it looks like he's going to win money. That's my read on it. Yeah, so I, I think the, the losses are always way, to me, way overinflated than the wins are for, for, for AEW. Because people will bring up, you know, Jade, which obviously is a big loss. But then they'll also bring up, like, Brian Pillman Jr. and all these other ones. And I'm like, I don't know, man. They, these are not big losses. They, 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 you, you are really, really over-exaggerating how big these sort of losses are. Especially when you nab Will Ospreay. You will let Jade go. You will let Brian Pillman Jr. go if you can nab a, a Will Ospreay. So that's a huge win for them. They've won more than they've lost, AEW, in, in terms of these contract negotiations. But with the tide turning and a lot of the way that this quote unquote wrestling war is going and whatnot, like you said, if 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 money goes back and, and goes back to being Sasha in WWE, that's a big loss for a company that that we wind and dined her, brought her over to, you know, Wembley, you know, felt like she was kind of on the cusp of getting in at any point. And if she was healthy, she'd be in by now. And for her to just then waltz right back into WWE, that um that would be a, a big loss. And that would seem like a big loss, and it would feel like a big loss for AEW, too. So it, it, that is definitely one that uh, is good I, for them to win. And I can tell you, Tony Khan is very cognizant of the perception yeah. of losing these. That's something that's important to him. Andrade, Khan made it official at the presser, said he was done as of uh, 12-31-23. And Andrade put out a tweet thanking AEW, thanking Tony Khan, thanking all the people he worked with, lamenting the people he didn't get to work with. And it seems like a very amicable split. Uh, he's obviously going to be making his way back to WWE. Uh, my read on this is interesting. We now have a pattern here with Khan. He doesn't embarrass people on the way out. He doesn't make them do an embarrassing job. He doesn't, he, he it seems as though one of his philosophies is to really treat guys with respect when they're leaving the company we saw it with jade we now see it with andrade who was booked very well on the continental classic and yeah he they both lost their final match in the company but not in like humiliating fashion they didn't get squashed they didn't you know weren't asked to do anything embarrassing it wasn't like the old school territory thing where they would really um, take advantage of someone leaving and, and and embarrass them on the way out or something that Vince might do to someone who was leaving. It seems to be a deliberate strategy by Khan to treat people very well on the way out yeah. so that they remember that. And his relationship, the, you know, Andrade, I was never hot on that signing. People know that. I kind of was like, I wouldn't want anything to do with this guy. I don't think he's as big a star as people make him out to be. And I'm going to take a mini victory lap on that. He wasn't any kind of difference maker. And he was a pain in the ass a lot of the time, right? 
but he played ball at the end. He did business the right way. He was a good soldier for the last year or six months or so. And Khan treated him right. And it seems like this was a super amicable split. Right. What's this is the way view? you would hope it would go. This is the way that it should go. And and in and, and a normal business, this is how things would be done. But it's not obviously it's not a normal business. So this is like a surprising thing that like the wrestler does business well on the way out and the promoter treats the guy well on the way out. And then they go their separate ways because the contract is not renewed or whatever. That's OK to do. But we live in this is such a fucking weird industry that this is a news story when like both people amicably decide this isn't a great move. But no, I, I, I think and I'm right with you, too. And, and, and I but. I was top of mind on on you know right with you in terms of Andrade not necessarily being worth all the trouble a guy that like yeah you know he looks like a million bucks but has never really you know never drawn to any big level never became you know a big you know a real big star beyond you know he had the takeover match with Gargano that was obviously incredible and and does some stuff here and there that is pretty good but but largely doesn't feel like a guy who who is really a needle mover and yeah I think this is also another case where even if his contract was due and I was con I'd probably say yeah you know what we don't you know, We'll be fine without this guy. You know what I mean? We we could save a little bit of money here and there. And oh, they won't miss him at all. Right. And They're I think that's 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 good. And that's healthy for the wrestling business too. To not keep a yes, guy sir. just because you're afraid of him going to the other side. Keep a guy because you and think I don't it's think Andrade wanted to stay anyway. No, no, exactly. So I think that's that that's a perfect scenario where they don't for you you don't want a guy that doesn't want to be there. You know, and, and force him into staying or whatever with some weird because that's that's a WWE thing too. It's like, oh, you, you got hurt, so actually your contract's for two more years instead of a one more. It's like, oh god, all right, fine, fine. You know what I mean? Like they love keeping people there when when they don't want to be there and then firing them in the middle of you know pandemics or whenever the hell they want. Uh, Khan has always done it the right way in terms of like letting people go when their contracts are done. But no, this is this to me was a no brainer. If 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 he didn't want to be there, his contract was due. It was up. Whatever money that you were going to need to pay him wasn't worth it. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm fine saying goodbye to Andrade. That, that, that's no problem. They won't miss him. I will say this. Khan has triggered team options on people. Yes. Doesn't no, he has. news a lot. Right. But he has stru- – he structures these contracts like sports contracts. There's a lot of team options involved. Okay? Um, I don't know if there's – I haven't heard of any player options. Not saying they don't exist. But there's team options attached to a lot of these deals, and they have triggered those. And there have been instances where, look, Cody's the best example of where Khan could have triggered a team option on him, but they amicably split, which is kind of what you, you're just alluding to. Um, Trinity Fatu, the word is from uh, Fightful, who got this from both sources in WWE and Impact. That when her impact deal is up imminently, she is on her way back to WWE or expected to be back with WWE. Um, Look, this makes it clear that her problem was with Vince, not with Triple H. That's number one. Right. Okay, that's obvious. Number two, I think that this is kind of like we talked about with Killer Khan. She went and had a little run with impact. The run's over. She's on her way back to WWE because it's a better situation there for her now than it was when she quit. Right. So this is kind of healthy to bounce back and forth. Um, the problem is impact. I think she's still undefeated, you know, and it's, yeah. it's kind of a bit, they got to find someone to beat her and for her to put somebody over. Um, I wouldn't have, don't think I would have booked her that strong where she'd still be undefeated this deep into her run. I'm not personally that big of a fan of hers. I, I, her work does nothing for me. Um, Trinity Fatu being an impact never one time made me say, Oh, I've got to watch and see what Trinity's up to. I just don't really care about her. Yeah. I, um, I think it was a good I, move when they did it. And I think it got some eyeballs at the time. And now is probably about the right time for her to, to, to leave. I think like the, and for impact, I think it's a smart idea too. If they can now capitalize on this by having her put somebody over, or it, it does feel like a little bit, too late now i feel like you maybe should have got that going you know in 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 october or november knowing that she's probably not there for the long haul and she's probably not going to be there forever and if she is you know you still have to maybe work on 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 using that quote unquote whatever whatever modicum of 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 i'm using quotes here star power she has to kind of put that onto anybody else and they didn't really do that and they just kind of treated her like the biggest star in the in 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 the women's division there and and now it's going to be time to kind of maybe Reworked that, but I they may have ran out of time. I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I, I don't know if that's uh and she still holds the world title too, the the knockouts world title. So um 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, a move that you do a hundred times, if you a uh, hundred times out of a hundred, if you're impact, you of course oh, sign yeah. her. You have to have to sign her. But uh, yeah, I think we're we're now seeing the end of it, where it's like, all right, you had your little run, you got some eyeballs on us. Nothing really long term changed. Our business trajectory didn't massively change. But you know, thank you for your your year that you were here, basically. And and uh, yeah, now we got to get somebody over when you're on the way out, and that that's going to be the key. So impact still is touting that they have a major signing coming up. I doubt that it's Zaya Brookside who is debuting with TNA uh, coming up. So Zaya Brookside, who I forgot was released from WWE. Yeah, I think a lot of people did. That was kind of the reaction from most people Um, uh, today was like, oh, (laughs) she's not WWE anymore. And it's like, nope, (laughs) she's been there, gone for a while. But uh, apparently she's been working stardom. And I obviously don't pay any attention to stardom. So I guess if you pay attention to stardom, you would know that she hadn't been there in a while. But um, she's on her way to TNA, Zaya Brookside. So, yeah. Okay. I mean, that's fine. Um, but I guess we just wait and see. I thought Sasha, Sasha Banks, there was an outside shot. She could be the big impact signing. I talked about it a few weeks ago because I thought maybe it would be something, even if it was just short term while she continued to weigh her long term option, maybe tell impact. All right, I'll come in for six months or whatever. Here's my price. Have some fun with Trinity. Obviously they're close. You know what I mean? Maybe work a program with Trinity there and just, you know, have, but now with Trinity on the way out the door and the news that Sasha's on her way to AEW more than likely, I have no fucking clue who this signing is that they're touting. Because yeah. Who's left? We're starting to run out of names here. Unless it's Okada <laughs> out of nowhere, uh, it's probably going to be like Dolph Ziggler. You know what I mean? And, and, and I don't know if you saw. Scott kind of walked it back a little bit. Was like, well, I didn't say it was going to be like a huge signing. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, I didn't see that. Yeah, I got, didn't see that. I forget his exact right. words, but he was like, I mean, it's it's a it's a big sign. <laughs> he kind of he got. I think he realized I ah, maybe I need to pump the brakes a little bit on uh, Nick Nemeth. Is what's Nick Nemeth doing in the Impact Zone uh, uh, type stuff? I feel like it's got to be Dolph at this point, right? Or like, it's not Ali. I don't think probably going to be one of those guys, like Dolph or Ali or whatever. But that's not a game changer. I mean, no one's going to be super stunned by that. And and. I, I don't know about Dolph. Dolph feels like a guy who might just be like, eh, I don't need this thing anymore. You know, he's probably made a millions of dollars. I'm sure he's okay doing whatever. Yeah, it's probably going to be Ali or somebody like that. But, uh, yeah, we're running out of people. And I, I don't think it's going to be, like, like like you said, the outside chance of it being Sasha or, or Mercedes or whatever, with Trinity on the way out, feels like that's a 0% chance now that, that she's going there. So, I don't know. It, it's going to be one of that group of released guys, Shelton, you know, one of them. So, um, you know, which will be fine. But, and promoters promote, so that's the way it goes. The thing about Tony Khan is if he's employing the lesser Nemeth, why wouldn't he want the other one? <laughs> sure, take him. <laughs> or no, no, don't take him. I'm telling TNA to take both of them, actually, is what I would prefer. But, yeah, you're right. Right, but, you know, if if, if you want uh, don't the don't other speak one's this into the Don't speak this into the ether. Ryan, Hollywood Ryan is who you're thinking about. I mean, Nick is clearly far more talented. Uh, well, why wouldn't you want him? Unless Price was... The, Unless Nick Nemeth is like, hey, look, I've been making three million a year for the last decade. I and and Tony's like, all right, it's a little rich for my blood, which I could totally understand because you're not going to get return on that investment. Oh God, no, 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 no. You know, and you could allocate those funds, you know, elsewhere. So, you know, that would be the only barrier if he's not willing to come down on price at this stage of his career. You know, his hit. Look, Dolph Ziggler's big money earning years. He has to know are behind him. He made a shit ton of money for a long time, but he's in his forties now and he's not a draw. So if you want to wrestle for a big time wrestling promotion, I don't think you're going to get paid what you've been getting paid for the last decade. You know, this is a, this is an athlete, a, a like in a real sport in baseball or baseball or basketball would be the best comparison. Cause NFL it's, it's, you don't guys don't hang around cause it's dangerous and it's just not good enough. You know what they hit the wall faster because of the nature of the sport. But this is a, like a baseball player who can't play the field anymore, can't run, but is still a good hitter, and he's a DH, but he's not going to make $25 million anymore. Someone might pay him $12 million Right, right. The Nelson Cruz. On a one-year contract. Who, who, Nelson Cruz yeah. lasted seven more years in the league just basically being like, yeah, I'll make $8 million and hit 35 home runs for you. I can't do anything, but right. you know, pay me X million, and I'll come in and hit some dingers for you. And then he did that for yeah a decade, basically. <laughs> he prolonged his career doing it. Right. So, you know, that's kind of what, what Dolph would have to accept. I know he's working Puerto Rico, right? So uh, He is. And apparently just got announced for Russell Khan as well. I don't know if just the signings of Russell Khan. I don't think he uh, – but uh, there you go. So he's presumably still – I don't know if in... the Puerto Rico thing is just a one-shot or he's doing a like a, like the fucking loop. But 
I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Do the island uh, loop? Yeah, no I don't one, know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Savio runs that. No one really pays attention, but they still fucking have a promotion down. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, it's like, um, all right, all Japan. And then we'll use these to transition into our next topic. Yoshitatsu announced he's out. Mm-hmm. So there's another all Japan guy on his way out the door. Obviously, they don't push him. You know, he's involved sometimes with the gay or a TV title. He's involved sometimes in the trios titles that they don't treat seriously. Um, he's an underneath guy. Um, but hold that thought. Suji Ishikawa is has removed himself from some of the shows coming up here in January, and he has also been replaced in his office resp- in some in at least some of his office responsibilities by Kento Miyahara. The position that Ishikawa held, which was the go between between the talent and the office, uh, is now Kento Miyahara's job. I can tell you that Suji Ishikawa. Uh, was at least in the room and most people thought that he was sort of the lead booker for the last couple of years. So it's unknown whether he's no longer part of the booking team. Uh, Omori, who just, we talked about last week was another guy who was, who was part of the office and in the room, as far as, you know, the book, these, these companies all use committees. It's hardly ever just one guy with the pencil, like it's 1978, uh, but Omori was another one. So you look, this is suspicious. Omori leaving the company. Mm-hmm. Ishikawa, uh, the big dog, possibly leaving the company. These were two of the guys who were, uh, you know, running the fucking booking room, you know, for the last couple of years. And now combined with all of the other exits, you know, Yoshitatsu, a guy who, um, you know, had a not a healthy exit from WWE. You know, he wanted to move to a Japanese community in Texas. And they told him, no, you have to keep living in Orlando. And then they, you know, there was a lot of contentiousness there. And then they, you know, they, they release him. And then he goes to new Japan, breaks his neck, ends up in all Japan. It leads to another discussion with, you know, Charlie Dempsey right there. As we speak, just pinned Nakajima this morning in the tag. I don't know why people are surprised. The guy's getting a title shot in a couple hours. Of course, he's going to pin the champion. I know people are, disappointed and they don't want this guy there but you should have seen that coming i mean that's just booking 101 so dempsey's there now on a tour he's getting the title shot in a couple hours we don't think he's gonna win but who the fuck knows it's just more weirdness yeah that show is going on right and now but we won't get to we'll be off the air by the time the main event hits the ring so we won't know yeah and it's just it's it's more weirdness going on regarding um the WWE involvement, maybe Yoshitatsu wants nothing to do with a WWE shared office. Maybe Ishikawa is the latest office uh, guy. And there's been many, there's been multiple, whether it's Omori or the referee that had been there forever, who is either being pushed out or again, doesn't want to take orders from, you know, some shared WWE office. It just continues. The concern is all I'm saying. And um, we all know how this story ends. We talked about it last week. Obviously I would prefer that, all Japan has no part of this, any kind of WWE relationship, or it could simply be William Regal getting his kid a booking and it goes no further than here. It's hard to tell. Right. It could be we all Japan. Getting... It could be two things. It could be, it, these could all be a coincidence and it's just all Japan uh, essentially is having some trouble paying some bills and is looking at these older guys and saying, Hey, you know what? Yoshitatsu, you make X amount. Thank you for your service. We got to go. Takawa Mori, I'm sure he was making a pretty good chunk of change. Sorry, you have to go. The ring announcer guy, yeah, you've been here for 41 years or whatever. Sorry, we got to, you know, uh, these little guys here and there that 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 need to, you know, maybe leave to help things a little bit. Make, you know, it could be that, or it could be, like you said, it could be because of the WWE relationship, which is, is we, we talked about last week that WWE hadn't said anything on their end. Well, now they did. They talked about All Japan on NXT tonight. Shawn Michaels. Shawn Michaels yeah. tweeted oh, out about it. Yeah, too? on tonight, they just sent, mentioned that Charlie Dempsey was in All Japan for wrestling or whatever. Uh, on you know on, on a trip to all Japan, so you got that. Uh, the chat room is telling us that Takeshita just got announced for an all Japan show on the twenty seventh. Yeah, and you know, and that lessens the concern a little because yeah. that's an AEW signed talent. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Forget DDT; I don't care about that. It's an AEW signed talent. So if a if WWE had their claws in all Japan, they would never allow that. So that actually makes me feel a lot better than I felt. At the beginning of this segment. That would never be allowed. Now Tony Khan. Probably wouldn't give a shit. 
He's more open to shit like this. Right. He doesn't care that Charlie would... Dempsey is in All Japan at the same time that Takeshi is in All Japan. In, in right. All he Japan. don't give a shit. Right. And even if even if he knew WWE was part of the running thing, he still probably wouldn't care. As long as he... It, all Tony Khan would care about is Takeshi that doesn't lose to Charlie Dempsey. It's the only thing he would care about. Okay? But WWE would absolutely care if they had money invested in all Japan or were now part of the office, they wouldn't book an AEW wrestler. So this is breaking news. We do this show live. This all went down in the last five minutes, according to the chat. This makes me feel a lot better. I will say this. I've said it in the discord. I've said it last week and I'll say it right now. I want to be wrong. I don't want WWE getting their Fuck claws no. in all Japan. Fuck no. I want to be wrong, but I've seen this play out so many times. And it always starts as something It friendly. smells. It smells. It smells. And you can historically, the Toronto office with the Tunnies, who eventually took over. Uh, you look at Blackjack Lanza selling, you know, eventually turning the Winnipeg office into from an AWA office to a WWF office. You look at Black Saturday with Vince McMahon going down there. And taking over the TV. You, you got recent examples. Yeah, okay. USA Wrestling. Evolve. I, I always go back to USA Wrestling, which is the perfect example of what the current thing was with the indies and Evolve and all that sort of stuff. It was people that don't know about USA Wrestling. Vince calling all the territories and saying, hey, I know you guys are down on your luck. Well, bring, send your tapes to me and I'll show your tapes on my USA Network channel. And then it'll, it'll help you guys you know, get more publicity and stuff. And they said, oh, okay, sure. And then he just said, oh, this guy's over, this guy's over, this guy's over, cool. I'll sign all these guys then. Thanks. So anyway, fuck all you, you know. Oh, hey, Junkyard yeah. Dog's over, cool. I'll sign him. Hey, this guy's over, I'll sign It's basically how we acquired all of his guys. He figured out who was getting over, who he liked. Basically, send me tapes of your top talents, and I will decide who I want to sign. And that's exactly what happened. So, you know, he played them yeah, for a and year it, and then signed all the top guys and said, thanks anyway, guys. But uh, here you go. Here's your tapes. I don't even know. And if you want examples from this century, fucking evolve. Yeah. You know, eventually getting involved with evolve and then evolve doesn't exist anymore or progress and the, and everything that happened in the UK where you get involved with progress, you hire the people who fucking own it. They sell it to these fucking geeks. And now progress is just, you know, a shell of what now look, that all happened before speaking out and speaking out came in and was kind of like the final nail, but you get the idea. It was going to okay, be done ball, anyway. It was on it a was trajectory. Be, yeah. Yeah, because remember that all they invaded UK and Europe before speaking out, and then speaking out was just the death blow. Um, but look, Rev Pro told them to fuck off, and Rev Pro still going strong. Okay, so that's all you need to know regarding that. But so if you want recent examples, there's recent examples. You want historical examples? I could give you ten more. Okay, so that's why I don't want them involved in all Japan, especially when all Japan is on an upward trajectory. Now, is All Japan making money? Probably not. Even with drawing 2,300 fans to this show we're about to talk about, and drawing another nice Corkin house, and drawing some nice Corkin houses the first. And, and, and we all know how great All Japan has been doing. Um, you know, but could they use, is it tempting for them if WWE calls and offers an infusion of cash or to become a partner? Of course it would be. But it seems like the fans at the shows have not been receptive to Dempsey. The fans at the shows and the fans on social media, from what I understand, from what I'm told to my people who understand Japanese and everything, have not are turning on this president with all of this bullshit. Oh yeah, yeah, very quickly. And the and the wrestlers aren't happy. And you see people leaving the company left and right. Now, is it all due to the WWE relationship? We don't know. But I want to be wrong. But I've seen this movie before, and it concerns me. Takeshita. I have a wave of relief because that is not the WWE MO. They would not allow that. If William Regal is getting, is, is, is the, is the go between here and he's getting marching orders from the top. Also that dude's a fucking slime ball too, by the way, people being like, I don't know that, that the, one of the biggest slime balls, one of the reasons that the fucking UK thing happened. You know what I mean? Like don't, don't let William Regal's presence make you think, Oh, it's just for his son. That's the dude that makes it worse. That's the guy that sold the UK down a fucking river and, and, and would do anything to sell a wrestling company down the river. So yeah, don't, uh, don't, don't think he's the good guy in this situation. Yeah. But the, 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 the cash of the thing, and he's going to work the 20 to show on the 27th. I mean, you know, that is, that's, that really makes me feel a lot better and it's going to give some pause on the, on, I was going to cut a much longer promo here, but I'm going to hold off. Yeah, I agree. That's why I wanted to kind of cut. I I wanted to interrupt you because I do think that changes my 
thoughts and trajectory a little bit um, I don't uh, want as this. well. And, you know, and it makes me sick. You know, look, I, I can't control other people's opinions. And I understand that there's a lot of outlets that don't really care about Japanese wrestling or the history of all Japan or the legacy. And, but I see other outlets like celebrating the fact that W that Dempsey's over there and they're working with WWE. And it's like, listen, that, that just annoys me, you know, because it's like, you don't care about Japanese wrestling. You don't care about all Japan. And, and when it really comes down to it, you don't give a shit about Charlie Dempsey working in all Japan. So what do you, why are we celebrating this? You know, if you, it's like, um, I don't concern, I'll give you a good example. I don't concern myself with the politics of Joshi. When do I ever do that? The answer is never because it's not my place as a fan. I'm not going to have opinions on Joshi wrestlers jumping back and forth or what stardom is up to or, or Tokyo or fucking fucking marvelous or fucking uh, whatever. I don't concern myself with it because it's not, I don't, I, cause at the end of the day, I don't give a shit. Yeah. You know, I would never celebrate some Joshi promotion getting invaded by fucking WWE. Oh, that's great. Maybe I, I can't wait to take a look when Nia Jax uh, 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 shows <laughs> right, up at fucking right, right. act res, you know, I wouldn't ever fucking say that. So it's like, if, if you're it's someone seedling, exactly, Oh, Nia Jax and yeah, seedling. Oh, yeah. I can't wait. And you're never going to watch wait, it. For, yeah. yeah. For that, for that fucking uh, Cora Jade seedling run. I don't, you know, I would never. So that kind of annoys me too, because it's like, fuck off. This isn't good. You know, does WWE have to have everything? How much do you people need? Like, leave us alone. Can we have anything? So, so you know, hopefully this Takeshi the thing is is a little bit of a pushback here. But um, let's talk about this show, this uh this uh this new year's eve show in 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 all japan at the uh what was the fucking building here i lost my uh yo yo uh, um, yo yogi national stadium gymnasium number two i believe i'm probably pronouncing that first part wrong but uh yeah they had 2687 uh in this place the problem was they didn't shoot it that well so you saw like the upper tank of this building looked empty the entire time there was some empty stage yeah, yeah they didn't darken it. they probably should have darkened that part but uh and that's a good house that's them. a good house that's though good yeah house. it was a pretty big building good house it was a fun looking building and it was a hot crowd uh as well that was there but uh, so, yeah 2687 you can't uh can't scoff at that but uh, yeah, a, a good house and this is the show that we mentioned uh last week was on all japan tv as usual but it was also on fight as well so if or, or, sorry triller tv plus uh so if you're a fight plus member at uh Voices of Wrestling.com slash fight, uh, you were able to watch this show as well. So that's kind of a cool little thing uh, for this Mania X show that they did uh, to also be on Let fight. me tell you something. You know, Nakajima, one one thing on him is um, he had always, ever, whenever he was on top of Noah, was not a good draw at all. In fact, he was an anti-draw. But this this feud with Kento Miyahara is, is, is doing business. I mean, uh, there's no doubt about it. And the work Nakajima is doing right now, he's sort of, people who don't know, he's embraced strong style and he is such a great fucking troll because this is king's road and he came out for this match to a noki's music and he's he's got um uh, uh stealing, he's still an elks king came out with him he's still an elks king gimmick he got boom by boom by ringing through the yeah, uh he's the coming speakers. out to yeah. a noki's music yeah he's got hisashi shinma who was for people who don't know uh, a key office figure during Anoki's days in New Japan, he's got him coming out wearing the Lion Mark fucking coat, the the scarf. He's got the red he's scarf. Wearing... He puts a red scarf around him, his his neck. Yeah. Nakajima's got his head shaved. He's wearing Muhammad Ali inspired gear. They're copying Ali Anoki spots in the match. Did you catch that? Oh yeah. Did you oh, yeah. catch where they? Where yeah. So he, he know, went down Nakajima... to the ground and, and started doing the thing that the famous like kicking yeah, spot no- where, where Anoki's kicks. yeah where Anoki's doing the leg kicks and the crowd. That's why I love fucking Japanese crowds. That's why I don't ruin it, WWE, you fucking assholes. Because he went down there and the fans went ooh because they knew you know what I mean. They knew in a second that that's what yeah. was it was happening. I love that. And I'm watching this match today and I didn't know any of this and and then he closed the show with Anoki's fucking closing speech. It's just such a troll job because this is all Japan. This is like. He's invading all Japan as the ghost of Anoki. This is brilliant. And this is and this is right up Nakajima's alley because he's the greatest troll in the world. Oh, yeah. He's just a, and, the look on his face. The guy just has to walk in and, and, and his face, just his face, whether he's smiling or frowning or whatever, his fucking face. He looks like an asshole. You know what I mean? It's just the guy's a fucking asshole. Yeah. And, and it's just uh, it's just amazing how Noah just 
look, I know he had his problems in that locker room. I know he can't be, he's not always the most agreeable guy, but even going back further than when it all fell apart, they just never got anything out of him. And, um, you know, it, it's uh, how Jake Lee work out, how Jake Lee work out for Noah. You know what I mean? It's like, and you see this guy comes here and they know exactly how to position him and how to push him and how to present him. And I'm sure he has a lot to do with this, with some of his ideas. And he has now uh, beaten Mia Hara twice. And, and I was, I was, I thought for sure Mia Hara would get the win back and then vanquish the WWE invader. You know what I mean? It just made too much sense but they didn't go that route. You know, this was totally, this was a left turn. I didn't see coming with this strong style stuff. And um, the way Nakajima's is, 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 I mean, this is brilliant. And, and I was, I'm watching this match and I didn't watch it till today. This is my feud of the year in pro wrestling. This is my Nakajima Miyahara is my feud of the year. And, you know, I, I know, this match was literally on New Year's Eve. I don't care. It's 2023. And they had their first match, which I thought was incredible. And then Nakajima comes in here and wins the Triple Crown title. And then they have this match with all this uh, Anoki shit. It, this, this is the feudal year to me. And, and and I thought they had a better match than they had the first time uh, uh, with this match here on, on New Year's Eve. And um, I am so curious where all this is going. And the the, the the worst thing that could happen now is fucking Dempsey beats Nakajima. And, and, <laughs> no. and that would just, that would rip my fucking heart out. It would be so debilitating, but I don't think they're going to do that. I think, you know, but, but what concerns me is Dempsey is booked beyond tonight, you know, um, you know, but who knows, I guess we'll see, but it would really be a shame to derail what Nakajima has going now. And now Miyahara has to regroup mm-hmm. after losing to this guy twice. And, it's uh just just excellent booking and it, and to me this nakajima and this version of nakajima for me for my taste is the most interesting thing happening in wrestling right now yeah the match is incredible if you haven't seen it go go out of your way to check it out it's just hard hitting as hell the crowd is just in the palm of these guys hands the entire time i saw some people that didn't like the finish i fucking loved 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 the finish because it all worked out too there was a, a, a spot in the match that totally transforms the entire thing like we said there's been a lot of enoki you know sort of references done by nakajima throughout the match at one point ketsumiara is coming off the ropes and he's he's getting ready for a lariat and nakajima just with a, a pet and Nakajima kick, the kicks that are like, brother, it's a work. You don't have to kick that hard. It's okay. Kicks Kento Miyahara's arm. And Kento sells it like death. The crowd gasps. You can hear it. I'm sure it fucking hurt too. And then the rest of the match, Nakajima is just working this guy's arm and working this guy's arm and working this guy's arm and kicking on it and stomping on it and destroying it. And Miyahara is doing just a great job of selling, a great job of selling. And you keep waiting for, okay, Miyahara is going to come back any moment now. Ah, he's going to, he's going to, I was able to watch this on spoil, which was great. So it's like any minute now, I'm like, yeah, he's going to turn around. Maybe he'll use the other arm. Maybe he doesn't need it, whatever. He's going to work through it and he's going to win this match. And then what happens is Nakajima puts him in Northern Lights Bomb, grabs the arm, puts him in an arm bar, and Kenta Miyahara just immediately attacks because there's nothing he can't, he, his arm's already hurt. He's fucked. He's in this arm bar. He's in the middle of the ring. There's nothing he's going to be able to do. It's either uh, this guy's going to break my arm if I don't tap i gotta tap i gotta go and and just yeah that how cool i love that finish i thought just it, it i love that it wasn't a bunch of different kickouts and stuff i love like we need to go back to having some more finishes like this where a match just ends because one guy just beat the other guy you know what i mean and this is a perfect example of that he puts him in the arm bar mihar has got nowhere to go he's done he's been destroyed his arm's been killed it's over i tap out you win and, and that's yeah I, I was stunned too because i did not think nakajima was going to get two over on uh, on Miyahara, and that was kind of our worry that you know Nakajima would would win this you know win the title lose this match here and then be off to you know show up at Wrestle Kingdom or whatever. But it yeah. doesn't look like the program's that. over, right? Right. Yeah. It doesn't look like that for now. So that, he not that... only beat him twice, he tapped him out the second time right. in humiliating fashion in the center of the ring. Hey, this is just brilliant, mm-hmm, brilliant. Mm-hmm. so good. You know, it's um, but it's just I, stuff that like American fans aren't really used to because like we we talked about it with, uh, with with Kingston with Eddie Kingston over the weekend with our, our World's End thing, and you and I are like, ah, we want the torture Eddie Kingston, the torture, and everyone's like, no, you don't want the fans to, you know, not, oh, he can't lose, he can't lose, they, oh, they'd be disappointed if he loses. It's like that's the best, man. The best is that you lose. You know, what I mean, that's that's something that's that's great about Japanese wrestling is that they are not afraid to have a guy lose a bunch of fucking times, and that it's only going to make it that much better when Miyahara does finally vanquish this guy. It made it that much better that you all thought. 
thought, oh, and I all thought, we all thought that, oh, man, Miyahara's going to come in here and get his win back here because, of course, he's not going to lose again. But now it's, like, even more torture. Now Miyahara's just got to be like, well, what the fuck do I do now? This guy, not only did he beat me one time, he came in, he embarrassed me. Now he comes in as a, a New Japan invader and beats me in the middle of the ring with an arm bar. Like, I'm fucked. What am I going to do here? And that, to me, the, the, the struggle to get back is what makes it all that much more fun and, and why I love Japanese wrestling. So I, I can't wait and to see he, how it plays and, out. And, and Miyahara was working deep undercard on the show last night. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's – it's um, the chat says Dempsey's not booked any further. I thought I saw him booked later in, in January, but everyone in the chat says no, so I'm probably wrong about that. Okay. Um, That's good. So we'll see. Um, as far as that goes, but I wanted to get that in there. That's it's that's you know ever since we've been going live, that that's, sometimes it's very helpful to have the chat, you know, so you don't send out a podcast with bad information. Um, as far as the rest of that show from uh, from that uh, uh, National Gym Number Two or whatever the fuck, because uh, we got to get the Wrestle Kingdom. Um, Dempsey worked with Yuma Anzai, and they beat Tatsumi Fujinami and Leona, and that's kind of the other thing where you know the father son team, but they announced Fujinami as the WWE hall of Famer. Right, They've right. been announcing Hideki Suzuki as Hachi man from NXT, which is hilarious because I, I don't think he was ever named on television. Hachi man when he was there. Yeah. I think like, he was just got tweeted as that, but I'm, I'm I'll, I'll try to look it up and see. I don't, he was on the roster page. Right. And they, but, and he appeared on television. I don't think they ever referred to him by name on television, but, Anyway, the point here is all these WWE tie-ins, which, again, was making people very nervous. But Dempsey was able to do – he's a – look, Dempsey's a good wrestler. I like watching him. He's, you know, he's he's a very good grapple grappling-style wrestler. You know he's going to have his fundamentals down because of who his father is. A lot of European uppercuts. Um, and he did well here. Not look that Leona match is no good. Used to, Leona's so bad. Fujinami is still Leona, better than Leona. How is that possible? Fujinami, <laughs> how well, is that is possible? Thing. Well, I was gonna say, it was Dempsey did well because he was working with Fujinami, who's a million years old, and Leona, who has at times been among the worst wrestlers around. Leona's only he's 30. He's only 30. Know, I, he's so bad. I don't know. He's terrible. I don't think he's as bad as he used to be. I, I think, well, look, yeah, I think he's good. <laughs> he was fucking the worst in the world for a while. He's just One of the, horrible yeah, really now. Was. I guess he's just horrible now. He sucks. Mm. He stinks. He's okay. I mean, I, I don't think he's good. Let me be clear. But he used to be just abysmal. And I don't think he's abysmal. I think anymore. his near 80 year old father is still better than him at wrestling. So it's close. Uh, you know, it's it's neck and neck. I'm not going to dispute it. I have hit Fujinami way older than he is. He's only 70. He's only 70 for the record. <laughs> but my, my point was Dempsey being in there with those two guys. You know, it's I thought he came across pretty good but considering who he was in there with. And then, like I said, he, he pinned Nakajima yesterday or today or this morning, whatever you want to call it. But it was kind of like he pinned him with a clutch. Like he didn't hit him with a fucking... He didn't knock him out and pin him in the right, middle. Right, hit him a fucking... huge kick in the middle of the ring and then roll him up one, two, three, and then dance in the middle of the ring over his dead body. No, yeah, it was. And then Nakajima popped up and wanted to fight him afterwards. It was like one of those. He caught him. He caught ah, him. Ah, you, you caught me. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, and then, you know, like you said, I guess the card is happening right now where he's getting the title shot. But, um, you know, the Dan Tamora beat El Lindemann for the junior title. Dan Tamora won the junior battle of glory, obviously. That match was pretty good, but I tell you what, my second favorite match on this show was the Saitos again. The Saito June versus Rice Saito. Oh, that was I so good. That match. that match rocked. I, oh god, that match yeah, it really good. did. I thought it was a genuinely good match, and and it's not a meme. It's not no. irony. Mm-mm. I like them. I I they they've found turned. a niche. They've turned the corner for sure, and the crowd likes them too more. They got in the ring these big motherfuckers, and they put their jackets down, and the crowd went oh because they knew we're gonna see yep. Saito versus Saito, and then the bell rang, and they just beat the shit out of each other like only brothers could do. You know what I mean? They were just like fuck off, man. Let's go. <laughs> I because they're battling. They were battling like unofficially for like who was the true rookie of the year, right? Because what wasn't it something where they both yes. got rookie of the year, and they're like no 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 hold on. <laughs> well, they, they finished. They both finished runner up or something. Oh, okay, is what it was. They didn't, they didn't win and it was um or did they win i don't think i they thought they won, they won. and then it was like remember. but they said the saitos and i feel like they weren't happy with just being the saitos the winning and they wanted to figure out who, which of the saitos was better and uh, apparently it's june it is better yeah so i i unironically thought that was the second best match on the show uh the the i did watch 
obviously the tag from this morning with Dempsey and Yuma Anzai over Hideki Suzuki and Nakajima. We talked about that. And I did watch Dan Tamora's first defense against Hikaru Sato. It was fine. Um, but I didn't watch anything else off that show. The Battle Royals always just gimmicky, and I never watch those. And, um, you know, Davey Boy Smith came in for these shows, and if they want to keep him around, that's fine. I, I, I wouldn't hate it. You know, he was in there with the grapple fuck guys the night before. But um, that's kind of what's going on with uh, with All Japan, and we keep an eye on the Triple Crown match tonight. But Nakajima just came across like such a fucking – like such a dude, like such a superstar with this, doing this whole troll job. It's just so good. And I would hate to see it end. I want to see this go on and torture this, this company and build to a truly big match where he finally gets knocked off by one of these. Got to be Mia Hara now because he lost to him twice. But um, yeah, it's really great stuff. And it's, uh, yeah, well, it was one of the best matches of the year on the last day of the year. Yeah. It's. And, and I, I wonder what it. it's going to do. I, I think it's going to do pretty well because I think it's going to be fresh in a lot of people's minds when we do our match of the year. Yes, it's going to. Um, it's going to one of a match like this. Like December matches usually do pretty good. A lot of it's like the early, early, early part of the years. Like Wrestle Kingdoms will stick with people forever, and then like end of the year stuff does pretty well. It's always those like middle of the year stuff, unless it's a big time G one thing. A lot of your June, Julys like those really struggle. Whereas yeah, like the end of the year stuff tends to do pretty well. Like you know, Final Battle. Uh, did, did great last year, uh, the one with FTR and the Briscoes or whatever, and 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 so I'm I'm curious what this one does, but uh, I don't know if this one's going to have the 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 legs to really maybe make it to the top ten, but I think it's going to get a lot of votes. I think it's going to well, get a lot of votes. Well, it's my feud of the year because when you consider, you remember when they first got in the ring with each other on the Muto show? Oh yeah, and how great that was. Well, because it it also played off of real life tension, which is when wrestling's at its yeah. best. When everyone's just like these guys fucking hate each other, and then they were in the ring, and you're like, I don't know, these guys might still fucking hate each other. I'm not sure. And and you know, and then yeah, to his debut in All Japan, which oh, I love that with the roses and the flowers and hitting him over the head with it, and ah, uh, he was mad at him because he lost. And yeah. he smacked him with the flower, you know, and and. Um, then they had their singles match coming off the Muto show in Noah, which Nakajima won. I'm like, all right, home turf, home turf. Um, you know, then they, they had the tag match in the real world tag league with Miyahara and Aoyagi losing to Nakajima and Omori. And then they just had the match the other night. I mean, that's my feud of the year. I mean, because there's been no other feud in wrestling that has hit me on the, oh yeah, this is why I love pro wrestling level like this one did. So you know, this is as much as this one did. And this is this. And, and you know, I haven't loved pro wrestling this year. I really haven't. Um, pro wrestling's let me down in a lot of ways. Nakajima and Miyahara have not. This has been great. And it's my, and, and Nakajima is my, the thing I'm most interested in right now in pro wrestling is this current Katsuhiko Nakajima run. And I think the now show. Watch this fucking it, NXT geek beat them. In <laughs> right, we're going to be so mad. Uh, this show was really good too. Like overall, I, it, it it speaks to it was a great way to cap off what was been a very good year for all Japan because I thought from the Saitos on like everything else was pretty damn good like you know, the, the early the early tag stuff was just you know whatever it, it was just a bunch of mostly junk and, and lower guys on the cards Kawamori obviously doing his last thing uh, Yoshitatsu doing his last match or whatever but from the Saitos on I thought everything else was great even even the even the Jiro thing I thought was okay <laughs> against Ashino and Tiok I thought even that was okay and then yeah the the rest of it I thought was was really good the Dan Tamora L Lindemann match awesome uh, the David Boy Smith uh, Hokoto Amori Minoru Suzuki versus Hideki Sato and Suwama that was okay but I, I I didn't hate that as much as I thought I would and then the, yeah it capped off with a really really great man event no, it was so, fine yeah. it was fine I didn't it was the match was fine right so know, so good show a, a good show to cap off all Japan's pretty great year. Uh, so Noah's the new year. I did not watch the entire show. Joe, you have seen nothing from the show, correct? I've seen nothing. Okay. I haven't seen it yet. So the talk of this show is going to be the main event, which was Kotobushi versus Naomichi Marafuji. Now, as of this recording, let me let me actually update this and see if it has changed at all. So as we are going live right now, the main event, okay, it's same same number, Kotobushi Marafuji. 0.59 on cage match. One of the worst ratings I have ever seen on cage match. Uh, and Joe, it is well deserved. This is a pile of absolute dog shit. This match horrible. I, words can't even describe how bad this match was. So Kota Bushi everyone's came... everyone's telling me the same thing. I haven't heard anyone say that people are being unfair. Yeah, I, I, I'm waiting to see if this ever turns around and it gets like an irony, like actually this is good or actually bad wrestling is good. You know, those sort of people. I think it's going to be tough for those people to do it 
because it's not it's not even like grappled well. It's very slow. It is painfully slow because what happens is for people that don't know, Kotobushi came in and I guess his ankles and shoulders were already fucked up or something like that. So he comes in, he's to be nicer, he to be nice as possible. He's as chubby as ever. He's not Kota Bushi. You know what I mean? When we saw him in AEW and we're like, yeah, the body's not quite Kota Bushi. Yeah, maybe he'll get there. He's worse than ever. He, he looks like he hasn't worked out since the last time he was in AEW. Whatever. It's fine. He can't move. He can't run. He can't kick. He can't grapple. He can't stand. He can't flip. He can't do anything. His ankles, he just falls over all the time. They work a match where Marifuji has to slow things down and be like, okay, let's just take it easy. And they're just doing generic grappling and not even good grappling, just really, really bad grappling, grappling that just does nothing for you. You're just, the crowd is dead. It goes 33 minutes and 26 seconds. Can we call a fucking audible? Anybody can Marifuji say, Hey brother, let's take it home. (laughs) This isn't working. Can, can someone come down and say, guys, this ain't working. Go home. It's over. It's fine. Like this is the main event is Kotobushi versus Marifuji, which, which caused a lot of controversy as well. Cause the GHC title match was in the same event. Kano and, and, and Soya was in the semi main event, but you get a Bushi Marifuji out there for 33 minutes. Kota can't do anything. He just keeps falling over. Eventually it ends with Kotobushi winning and defeating Marifuji. The crowd makes no noise at the finish and then it's over and they kind of wheel Kotobushi's body out of the ring and he can barely, he can't even stand. Marifuji tries to do the, I'm going to raise this guy's hand and, you know, do the, ah, this guy, Kotobushi can't even stand. He apparently has to go to the hospital afterwards because he, he fractured both of his ankles or something like that. Who the hell knows? But just an absolute abor- uh, an abortion of a match. Awful. Awful, awful stuff. And I'm I'm so bad that I, I, I do wonder if it's even so bad that even the ironic, like, um, hipster, oh, actually, it's it's actually a good match. Like, I don't even know if those people can, can do that with this match. It's that bad. Is it worse than Abaddon Julia Hart? Yes. Okay. It's sad. Right. It's like a sad match. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it... it it, it reminded me a lot of there's there was a bunch of those Mudo matches that you and I fucking hated. You know what I mean? Yeah, that yeah. people pretended were good, where it's just like he's just slow and can't move or whatever. It's that times like ten. Because at least Mudo knew, like you know what I mean. Mudo was like, ah, you know, I'm Mudo. I I, I know where I'm at these days. Mudo, Mudo is always going to have that presence. Well, and and that's and that's exactly my point was going to be. Mudo knew that his body can't do what Mudo did in 1989 or in 1992 or whatever, but his charisma can do that. Kota never had yeah. that sort of charisma. You know what I mean? So th- it's yeah. like devoid of any emotion. Marifuji's out there just trying to chop this guy, trying to get anything going from this crowd. They don't care. Kota's doing nothing. He's just trying to survive another minute of this match. It's brutal. Brutal. The Tony Khan's paying that guy. I like, know. He's under contract. Dude. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, that's a favor to Kenny and all, but that's it's an ugly situation. I mean, he's completely finished he's done like. he's done it's it's not even like you know there was the he's washed and now i think it's like right like, maybe right. just end this you know just like just like like the, the aew abushi was all right that's just a very average pro wrestler right who has nothing special about him anymore right like, this is like this guy should probably be just... not wrestling ever again like this that maybe right, right. maybe it's it best that this horrible. guy finds a different thing to do with his life instead of pro wrestling because yeah it was bad and merit food i'm man credit to him he was wrestling a broomstick here. <laughs> My man did yeah. not look happy when this match was over. <laughs> he looked like motherfucker. Not exactly a man who's in tremendous shape himself. Uh, no, yeah. And you're like, yeah, this guy's doing it all. He's carrying this whole match. At one point, yeah. he has to, people in the chat room were talking about it. He has to dead weight Abushi up to the, to the top turnbuckle because Abushi can't lift himself up or can't jump up to do It's so bad. Wow. Uh, just, well, just brutal. I'm yeah. definitely going to watch it. I mean, I'm going to watch all these shows, you know, first week of January, Pearl all over the place. Um, you know, it sounds like, a, you know, driving it's, past it's a depressing. car wreck and you can't look away. Yeah, it's depressing. So, it's boring as fuck, too. The crowd, make no, the crowd realizes very early on this guy doesn't have it. And they give them nothing. Yeah. They give these guys nothing. They try. There's like one point in the middle of the match where Arbushi's firing up a little bit and doing some kicks. And they're like, all right, all right, here we go. And then he like does one kick and then falls down and then grabs his ankle. And they're just like, okay, please end this. What are we doing here? <laughs> we have to go. And they, yeah, anybody who, whoever signed off on this being 33 minutes and 26 seconds and then at no point told anybody in the ring, hey, hey, let's cut this thing short, guys. This isn't working. Uh, that That's a disaster. So did not see the rest of the show, so I can't speak to that. But uh, I heard that... Uh, what was the match? Ishii and Masakitamiya was great. I heard a lot of people really, really like that match. Oh, and... I'm surprised that was great. Yeah, can you what imagine? <laughs> 15 minutes, you write Tomoro Ishii and Masakitamiya, and you write 15 minutes on it. 
Uh, yeah, it's amazing I'm that in. that would uh, deliver. And then Kano and Manabu Soya, I heard, was pretty good as well. Yeah, you know, I, I want to see Soya in that spot, you know, with the way they've built them up and everything. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I I just didn't have time to get it in before. You know, it is Tuesday. So um, lost a couple days here of, of, of being able to get some shit in. But um, looking forward to those. Yeah. All right, so that is uh, Noah, and uh, that is everything but Wrestle Kingdom. So, yes, a couple years ago, Wrestle Kingdom was four hours of the show. Ah, now it's, you know, last 20, 30 minutes of the show. But it is happening this week, obviously. Uh, we're going to be uh, on Thursday for Instant Reaction Live, so make sure you subscribe uh, to the $10 tier over at FlagshipPatreon.com because when immediately when this fo- uh, show ends, uh, we'll be going live uh, over here at uh, FlagshipPatreon.com. So, obviously, the main event is Sonata versus Tetsuya Naito. <clears throat> Choking up. So much emotion here with the, uh, the roll call hopefully coming here. Uh, IWGP World Heavyweight title. Sonata and Naito. Where are you going with this one? So I think 2023 was a lousy year for world champions in pro wrestling. Okay, You had Roman Reigns who just was vacant, not around. And I thought a lot of the bloodline stuff once we got past the Cody match at WrestleMania was really the shits. I mean, the, the Jay Uso match from SummerSlam and some of the tags. And then he just disappeared, you know? Yeah. And um, so WWE did not have a good world champion. I know, you know, maybe in the eyes of some WWE fans, but he wasn't even around. So, you know, and then they had to create a fake world champion. And Rollins did nothing special to me at all, even with the fake world title, if you want to count that one. I mean, those Naka, those Nakamura matches were okay, right? So um, then you had uh, Jake Lee, who was a complete <laughs> and utter disaster. Um, MJF, and we've litigated that over and over and over. And at the end of the day, I can't sit there and tell you that I'm particularly fond of the title reign that he had. You have Dragon Gate, where Yuki Yoshioka and, and of course, Kakuta later just couldn't get over. And, um, you know, so they, they didn't have a good world champion all year long. And then that brings us to Sonata, who this was, to me, the worst IWGP title reign, maybe, of, of any real length. You can't count, you know, guys who held it for a month and didn't have a defense. Maybe ever, with the exception of Jay White's second. The, the J White second reign was abysmal. I can't put this one behind that one. Other than that, for a, a, a reign of any length, this was horrible. I mean, this guy just didn't bring anything to the table. And on top of that, he hasn't contributed to the build of this match at all. No. I mean, this doesn't feel like a hot match. He's just dead behind the eyes. Can, can you name all and- of his title defenses off the top of your head? Uh, evil. Um, the uh, Jack Perry. Mm-hmm. Let's not. And you know, I see a lot of people who are like, "Oh, well, yeah, you can't hold the Jack Perry one again." Why? What do I care if it happens somewhere else? <laughs> He's the IWGP Heavyweight he, Champion. He, yeah, he can't go out there and have a good match just because it's in a different company and someone else booked it. So yeah, the the evil like lumberjack. Yeah, lumberjack death one. match or whatever. Yep. Jack Perry, mm-hmm. Hiromu. Mm-hmm. Obviously, he beat Okada for the title. Right. Uh, well, you're missing the you're missing Yoda, one because it was Yoda yeah, Yoda like, and, and that's the guy who outclassed him immediately and just spent immediately, the next, yeah, and spent the next match, 17 minutes obvious. outclassing him the entire time when it was like, holy shit. And Joe, that is it, though. That's the entire Sonata run there. He beat Okada in April. He beat Hiromu in May. He beat Yotsuji in June. He beat Jack Perry in June. He beat Evil in October. And here we are. Yeah. And, you know, the, the G1, they had him beat the whole block. But, you know, outside of that fact... Do you were you particularly fond of a lot of his? He was okay, he's but fine. he's not like he's the IWGP World Champ. He should be the best guy in the fucking tournament or in the conversation. All of the criticisms of Sonata came to pass. He doesn't grab anything by the throat. He's dead behind the eyes. He's emotionless in the wrong ways. Right, passenger to his him. own reality. Passenger to his own reality yes. all the time. 
and it all came to pass and it just didn't work and it sucked. And I think he's the worst real champion of any length in a long, long time, other than Jay White. Jay White's second reign. Okay. Jay White, yeah, because Jay White, the first Jay White, anyway, that I'm talking about that second Jay White reign, which was just, he wasn't even around. <laughs> he won the title. Yeah, he won at Dominion. Then he did Forbidden Door. And then I think he faced Tama Tonga four months later and then just came back and lost to Okada and then left the company. It was like, all right, thanks, Paul. Yeah, that yeah, one was terrible. I can't put it behind that one. Right. And he I wasn't can't. there for anything. He just came, he had the title, yeah. you forgot he had the title. And then, yeah, that, that one, he was an absentee champion, basically. You got to be fair. You can't you can't put it behind that one. And I'm just hoping that Naito beats him, and that's the end of this. And we move past it. It didn't work. There's better people uh, ahead. You know, Yota Suji was mentioned. We see what you know what happens with Yuya Uemura. We see what happens with you know um, you know Renderita turning heel, and then we see what happens with you know um, um, your boy Shota Aminu. You know, there's blue skies ahead. Sonata, this should be we're done. firmly. We we're don't, done here. We don't do this again. Right, we're done here. We're done here. Um, so that's kind of my take on it. I think we're all over it. Um, and here's the other thing. I'm, I'm now, can we finally fucking be done with Muto? Because I understand this match just has a lot of heavy Muto story. Mm-hmm. I know. I get it. I, saw, I know. I get it. I get fine. it. But, uh... I'm done. I'm fucking <laughs> done with this guy. I personally don't give a shit about Sonata being Muto's boy and Naito being the next wrestling genius. I know there's people who are into that. That's fine. Not me. Couldn't fucking care less. I don't want to discuss KG Muto ever again. Unless I'm talking about like if we're doing a retrospective series. Career. Yeah, we're yeah. doing a retrospective series or or yeah, we're talking about the Hall of Fame. I'm I'm good otherwise. Yeah, that's fine. But I'm done with him. I'm so sick of him. And he's even infiltrating this, and he's not even around. I'm sure they'll have him at ringside. Oh, of course. Oh, he'll be there. Okay. But I just want Naito to beat this guy and be done with it. Let's do your do your little fucking fist bump if you got to, you know. The big question is, will Sonata join in? That's the big question. I when don't know. Naito, because last time Kenta crashed the party. Mm-hmm. Remember? Mm-hmm. So now they, they, the, the, the LIJ fans want Naito to stick the fist up with cool. his boys. And right. will Sonata join in? Great. And okay, fine. Let's have Sonata do it too. And then let's please just never go back to this shit ever. No more Sonata. And let's move forward. And whatever we're going to do with these young guys. And 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 they're, so that's my take. I'm not excited or interested in this match. No, this is the least now, excited I've been for for a Wrestle Kingdom main event in the entire time that we've done this show. It's just I. I think I, I have no I juice for it. Completely agree. And. It's not that I'll be dragging my feet watching it with my arms crossed. I want to enjoy it, and I hope it's good, you know. But and and I think it, it will be. I look. I don't think Naito. I don't think it's possible that he has a bad Wrestle Kingdom main event. Sonata is always a wild card. I'm yeah. That's the problem with me. I I don't know about Sonata. I don't even I in the J, even in the Jay White days where it's like ah fuck Jay White hasn't been around and this build sucks or whatever. I knew that in a big moment, I thought Jay White and Okada or whatever were going to go out there and have a good match. And they always did. You know what I mean? They always went out there and had a... I don't trust Sonata to have a big enough match or a good enough match. I hope I'll be wrong. I hope I'm wrong on Thursday. I really do hope I'm wrong. He's the guy I don't trust. I, I trust Naito more than I trust anybody else in a big spot. I don't trust Sonata to, to rise to Naito, the moment. Naito will get it done. He's going to get it done. He's not going to have a bad match. He'll His knees could fall off, and he's going to have a good match. He's not going to have a bad match. I... I, I I, I, I'll, I'll stick my neck out. He, this is going to be a good match. Is it going to be a four and three quarter star? Remember it for your match of the year. I, I, I won't go that far. It could be. Wouldn't be surprised. But it'll be a good match. Uh, otherwise, on the show, Brian Danielson and Okada, not a whole lot of build for this. It's just kind of the rematch. And, and this is, I mean, not a whole lot of build for this is unfortunately going to kind of be the theme of, of this preview for uh, uh, New Japan. It's not just us. I mean, go and read our previews that we have up at VoicesOfWrestling.com. I know Jay Michael wrote a really good uh, a piece about Hiromu and El Desperado and the background of them. And the part two that's going to be out by the time most of you guys listen to this, it's just more about how they really haven't done a great job of building this match or, or a lot of matches on the card. And I guess Danielson and Okada is kind of the same way, too. It's sort of an international, quote-unquote, dream match. We saw it at Forbidden Door. Brian got hurt, so that obviously maybe took the match down a notch. But now they're going to have it again. I'm sure it's going to be great. I mean, it's two of my favorite wrestlers of all time. I'm excited about it. But I can't say that I'm like, you know, 
I'm, I'm salivating at the idea of seeing this match. Like, I, I can't wait to see it because it's going to be great. But it's like, I don't know if they've done enough in terms of promoting it to get me, like, feeling like, oh, my God, this did is going to be something I have to see, you know. Did you watch the the eight-minute Brian Danielson sit-down promo? Yeah. Mm-hmm. See, I like that, and that got me into it. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, it If I remove this match from the card, this is dire. I mean, I, I don't even. Thank it's God it's the match, match I care about the most, if, if that says anything. Yeah. And they and, and the build has been Brian Danielson sitting down and talking about it. And then these guys having a match before. Yeah, see, I'm more into it than you are, it sounds like. Because I, I like the idea that Okada broke his orbital bone. I like the idea that Danielson beat him the first time. Danielson, at the end of that, saying, you broke my eye. I'm going to break your arm. You know, Danielson already set the template for how the match is going to be worked. Because he talked about how. I'm going to take away his strength. I'm taking away that arm. I'm taking away that Rainmaker. Yeah. And I'm going to break his arm. And I'm into it. I, uh, I'm I'm really by, into this. By the way, these two guys are fucking phenomenal. And had, if there's not going to be an injury in this, it's going to be. I, I I think that took – a lot of people are low, uh, pretty hard on the Forbidden Door match. I liked it. I thought it was pretty damn good. I liked it. I thought it was a really great match. Right, I didn't right. have any problem with that. No, I know. Some people are like, oh, you know, we got to we gotta admit that that was a pretty mid-match. And I'm like, no, we do not. <laughs> so we do not have to admit that it was a mid-match. But I think that they had better in them, and I think I said that at the time. And I, I'm hoping that this yeah. is the better in them in, in, on this night for sure. They definitely have better in them, and I'm confident this is going to be great. I'd be surprised if it's not my favorite match of the show, unless Sonata and Naito just really knock it out of the park. Uh, Moxley versus Will Ospreay versus David Finley for the IWGB Global Heavyweight title. Yeah, look, the 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 um the company has to protect themselves. I get it. It's just disappointing, and I don't know. I I. We've talked about it before, and I don't have a ton more to add. We could sit here and grind our teeth and and shake our fist that David Finley's involved in this. It totally takes all of the juice out of it for me. Um, but this is a – look, would they have been better off doing Moxley versus Will and then have David Finley beat the winner at New Year Dash or something? Yeah, I think so. Um And that's not even just booking for the Westerners. That would be a good idea, I think, to yeah. have – look – why not have Finley do the attack he did to set up the three way to the winner of this, and then and then beat up that guy with the shillelagh, weaken him, soften him up, and then beat him at New Year Dash? That accomplishes what this is accomplishing in a better way, I think too. So, what a waste of a John Moxley Will Osprey Wrestle Kingdom. Match. That's all. <laughs> I know that's all it is. Yeah, it, it's and 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 yeah, like you said, people saying, "Oh, well, it's not for the Westerners." Will Osprey was the IWGP champion. He's a, a big time deal. Uh, well, Japan, they like John Moxley. Who is it they for John Moxley? Yeah, right. Why am I to believe that Japanese fans want this shit? Right, Japanese well, like, fans want David Finley. No, they don't want David Finley either. Like it's the company protecting itself. I get it, but I don't think anyone likes this idea. Yeah, it feels like nobody's like happy with it. It's like AEW wanted to protect both of their guys. New Japan doesn't want to do this. Now, it, it's all, it, I don't know. It's so, it, it's, yeah, what a waste. What a fucking waste of it's Moxley and It's not a Japanese guy being added. It's the, it's a shitty white guy. <laughs> right, so why would right. the Japanese people be excited? I don't know. That's just like the go-to. Ah, it's like, ah, you guys don't like it? Ah, the Western fans. And it's like, okay. The, the Japanese fans are, are clamoring. Oh, we must get David Finley involved. Yes, yeah, shut up. Go away. God, just fuck off to NXT with Brogan already, please. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Hiromu and Desperado, I mean, it's going to be good because those guys always have good matches. I just, I can't pretend to care. I can't lie to you and tell you I care about this match. You know what I mean? Like, I've seen people be like, oh, come on. I don't understand. Like, what? And, and, and like I said, J. Michael wrote a really great piece for us at Voices of Wrestling.com all about their feud, all about the background, all about the stuff. I'm glad. I'm glad that people that are into this are into this. I can't lie to you and tell you I'm into it. I'm not. I don't care to see Hiromu and Desperado ever again. I'm sorry. How, how good is that guy? Oh, my oh, it's, God. Yeah, it's stupid. J. Michael, like, He's the best wrestling writer on the planet. Can I? Is that fair? That's fair. Well, because Neil Neil retired. Now he just does podcasts like an idiot. He doesn't do the written word anymore. So he does this. Yeah, it, Neil Neil Neil's lazy like us. He just talks. <laughs> right, right. And, um, and it's and it, the, what he does on the podcast is Eurograps Express. By the way, on the Voice Wrestling yeah. Podcast Network is just as good as his written word. But he's not a written, he's not a writer anymore. So no, he's out. He's gone. It's probably Jay Michael. I would agree. I mean. When you're talking about someone who writes in about wrestling and and really surrounds you and, and gives the 
gives the the match a life right and and really you know it's it's and the angles that he sees i mean the guy is great i i don't you know i i don't think he gets enough praise no he doesn't you know, on and our the, little on our little humble outlet you know and it's like the soromu stuff know, and, and, the, the Hiromu desperado thing is insane he like breaks down every match that they've ever had and like yeah what they did with their masks or on, on this night what mask desperado wore how Hiromu touched the mask what they said in the pre it's it's fucking it's insane it's wild yeah it's um it's just so good and it's 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 a shame that you know we're in a world where um talentless aggregators will their work their quote unquote work will be seen by more eyes than than stuff like this mm-hmm. it's really is a shame right you and know, while, while we're putting our um, website over to kevin Hare wrote a great piece about the redemption of eddie kingston uh, yes uh, today. he did you That's know I, I and i and, you know i'm not even into the kingston thing but that was incredible too and and the work that they put into the wrestling 101 him and robin reed all year long too it's um you know, we'll just continue to exist in our little fucking slice of space. Right. And, and, you know, it's, if you know, you know, and, um, we will never aggregate ever. I will, I will. Oh God, no. I will never, ever be associated with aggregation in any way, shape or form. So, um, not the time or pla- listen, I, that rant's coming. I didn't do it last week. <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to. I'm not going to do it now. Um, light week. I, I wanna, On a light week. We'll, 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 I want to we'll. separate myself enough from it where I'm not as emotional. You, I want my emotions to calm down. And I, but that that discussion's not even a discussion. That rich, give me four minutes is coming. I'm just letting you know. Okay? I'm not going to burn bridges or – but it's coming. Anyway, let's move forward with this review. Uh, Bishiman, uh, they are the uh, IWGP Tag Team title. We got this IWGP Tag Team titles, New Japan Strong Open Weight Tag Team Title match here. Bishiman, uh, Goto and Yoshihashi again versus Grills of Destiny, El Fantasmo, and Hikuleo. The problem is I'm out on Hikuleo forever. I, I have no interest in watching him do anything. So I, I don't have any interest in the match. I'm a little um, more pro Hikuleo I, than you. Uh, you the are. problem you are. is yeah. we just saw this match. Like... Not that long ago, you know. What I mean? It's like it's just kind of like, all right, cool, we'll do it again then, I guess. So, yeah, um, it's, um, it's it's hard to get excited about a match that we just saw, you know, not that long ago. And and you know some what people I want, really like that match. I didn't. I, I thought it was fine. I thought it was way too long and and wasn't. Oh, that I didn't like so. it either. Yeah, we talked about that. That match stunk. I, I, it's way too fucking long. Listen, I want new New Japan president Hiroshi Tanahashi to just get rid of New Japan Strong. Can we get rid of all these dopey belts and? We already kind of folded one of them into the all AEW Triple Crown. I legitimately forgot that there's a New Japan Strong Women's Champion. <laughs> yep. Like, I I don't remember that there is one until I'm like, I see a title defense scheduled. I'm like, oh, yeah. I think that company has, fucking... what is the actual number of titles that they have? It is absurd when you look at the number of titles. AEW's got the same problem as well. But but New Japan has the IWGP World Heavyweight title, IWGP Junior Heavyweight title, Never Openweight title, Strong Openweight, KOPW 2023, New Japan World Television title, the IWGP Tag Team titles, IWGP Junior Heavyweight Tag Team titles, the Strong Openweight Tag Team titles, the Never Openweight Six Mans, then you have the IWGP Women's and the Strong Women's title. Too many titles. Yeah. That's they too 13, many. There's, there's 13 active titles. That's too many. Now... The strong is part of this triple crown, and we don't know what that's going to be. And I hope it's just like the all Japan triple crown, and we don't ever break it up. Just make that a title now. Um, but we don't need the strong tag team titles. We don't need the strong women's title. They we don't need them. So let's just get rid of those. Um, you know the rest. Look, the IWGP women's. We'll see what Tanahashi how how Tanahashi feels about that too. These are all. It's a new guy who, unless it's a figurehead thing, and I don't think it is, you know, maybe we ask that. Because what is is that doing anything for anyone? She's not on this card, Iwatani. No. Like, what's the point? It was for Sasha. She's gone. Right. Can we just fold that? Can we do a title for title with one of the 19 stars? How many? Doesn't stardom have like three world titles or something? Can we just 
um, like the red belt. How does that work, Rich? You would I don't think. Well, so like, I don't think they're as wild as you think they are. Uh, the the world well, of stardom. The 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 main. I'm title, not trying to put it down. I'm just saying. No, no, no. I'm just saying. I don't think they have as many titles as you think they do. They have the world of stardom championship, which is their top title, and then they have the the wonder of stardom, which is like their secondary one or whatever. Then they have the high speed, which is kind of like your high flyers, your junior heavyweights. That's kind of it. You know what I mean? Like the other ones are okay. tag titles or whatnot. So yeah, it's not it's not as bad as you might so, think it is. Let's kill the strong title, or let's just do a match to kill it. Have Iwatani beat Ju- Julia's leaving anyway, right? So yeah, it doesn't look like she's staying. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where she's going, but uh, yeah, it doesn't look good. Have Iwatani beat her, and then have whoever the World of Stardom champion is beat Iwatani. And let's just be done with this because this experiment not only hasn't worked; it was for one specific wrestler who they don't employ anymore. Right. Let's be honest about it. Okay. So those could be done with Kingston's is a, is a triple crown. We have no use for a a strong open weight tag team titles. And let's consolidate this and get back down to the fucking nine (laughs) that we used to have, (laughs) you know, it's, it's yeah. So it, it, you know, whatever. Um, uh, get into it. Instant reaction live this Thursday. Flagship Patreon.com. Shingo Takagi versus Tama Tonga for the never open weight tag team title. I am going to tell you right now when that song, when that Tama Tonga you know, hits the arena in this empty Tokyo Dome, or this not necessarily an empty Tokyo Dome, it's just hollow no matter what. Unless you have 60,000 people in there, it's kind of hollow. But that song is going to play. He's going to saunter down to the ring, and I, it's going to be 4 a.m. or something. I'm going to be like, oh, my God, I need coffee so badly. I just cannot. Hopefully, Shingo can get a good match out of this guy. Pin this dude and son of, you know what? The bloodline needs some extra uh, people that are not uh, of, of Samoan descent. Fine. Go. Great. Please. Get involved in this rock thing, please. We got. You we, keep saying that, but do they really need people not of Samoan descent? They uh, haven't really gone down that road. Yeah, they should. Why not? I'm just trying to find. They're, I'm they're just they're all... trying to find something for this guy to do that's not in New Japan. I don't want him anymore. Please, no, thank you. I'm done. ML is this how you feel when I? Is this how you feel when you feel like I'm going to get you canceled all the time? Because <laughs> I feel like you're going to get me canceled for for booking these tongans into the Samoan <laughs> no it's fine it's good enough killer khan wasn't mongolian it was fine you know it's, it's okay we can go you know mlw has two guys then they're not Samoan. it's fine it's okay it's okay the or they views used to expressed by rich crates do not necessarily <laughs> reflect the views expressed i just want him somewhere um, else i just somewhere else just somewhere i else. agree that they should all just go away all three of them and and it, not even just because they've been around forever but just to freshen up and get new people in there and and but yeah, we just saw this match, and I really liked it. But I don't need to see it. Right, I'm again. good. I'm good. That it was like the best that you can get out of Shingo and Tamatonga, and then they're like, "Let's run it back." It's like, no, it's never gonna probably gonna be as good. It's okay. We didn't need that. Go away, please. Um, Kaito Kiyomiya and Shota Umino versus Evil and Ren Narita. Ren Narita's yeah, evil I mean, now, Ren so did... he wears a hood and he's yeah. very scary. Well, the the. Yeah. The knockoff Shibata thing clearly wasn't working anymore. I thought it worked well in the beginning, but it, he did run out of steam, and it does feel like he's fallen behind his other guys to some extent. So I don't think working as a heel for a while is the worst thing. Let's see how it goes. I don't like House of Torture, but, you know, I got the hiccups all of a sudden. But, um, you know, let's see if this gives him a little bit of a spark. And, Hopefully this isn't loaded with wrenches and grilt wires and everything. Let's we'll see. But um Okay. You know. No, I hear you. The back to back of this been... match with Garot wires into Tamatonga's music is just <laughs> at three AM's got me uh yeah. Not excited. Not yeah. That's and then it, one that it you, all concludes with Sonata. <laughs> it all concludes with the heat magnet that is Sonata. You know what I mean? Like it's like oh man. At least at least when these matches are happening on, at three a.m. At, at a Wrestle Kingdom when you know I just woke up or whatever. It's like ah you know what? At least we're gonna get Omega and Okada. We're gonna get Will and Shingo. We're gonna get this and this one's ending with Sonata. You know what I mean? It's like oh god. But uh, there's enough decent why stuff not, on the show. Why not get Rohe? Why not get Rohe Oiwa in there and then? put another house of torture guy and make it a six man. Cause Kiyomiya has been teaming with Oiwa. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I guess Ask the idea Gato, man. is, o- I don't know. That's Gato. <laughs> Not sure. I guess the idea is Oiwa <laughs> is technically on excursion to Noah and you don't want to bring him back yet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, Yota Suji versus Yuya Uemura. So that's, uh, that should be fun. Those are two, two decent well, guys. Yeah. More of this, please. Yeah. You know, and then we get a fucking winner and a loser and, 
you know, and, and we, you know, that match is like a seed planting match. Kind of like that whole G1 block was remember all of the winners and losers when all these guys face each other in singles, because it might matter four years from now. You know what I mean? So that's one of my most anticipated matches on the show. Uh, Zack Sabre Jr. versus Hiroshi Tanahashi for the New Japan World uh, TV title. I mean, I can't get, I can't in good conscience get excited about a Zack Sabre Jr. Hiroshi Tanahashi match in 2024, right? Well, we've seen it a few times. We've seen it a few times. I, I will admit. Two good wrestlers. Two times. good wrestlers. Yeah. But I don't know. Can't can't say that I'm excited about it. So then, uh, I think I think the uh, I I think it's a giant rib by Gato to just keep this TV title on Zack Sabre forever. Oh, and you know that the previous president wanted it to be on like a 25 year old very badly. Yeah. Because Gato never wanted the belt. He never asked for this. He didn't want this. This was forced upon him. And he said, Oh, young guy, young guy. Huh? Okay. All right. We'll, we'll see. We'll see who I put this title on and who holds it forever. Right. Cause we all thought Ren Narita was going to win. It. Right. Right. Yeah. And Sabre beat him. And then, you know the saber matches have been fun. Oh yeah, yeah. He's he's I'll approaching he's approaching a year with the title, and, and you know you just know yeah. Gato's just laughing at his little bottle of whiskey yeah. or whatever. Ah, young man, Zach Saber Jr. Yeah, you know what I mean? like, stroking his beard, yeah. stroking his beard. <laughs> ah, poor, ah, young man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And Zach doesn't yeah. care. He goes out there and has good little matches, yeah. you know, good little 10 yeah. minute matches or whatever. But you know that, yeah, while they're, you know, at the booking meeting and they, you know, talking about, oh, it's got to go on a young man. He goes, ha ha, young man. <laughs> Zach Saber. Oh, I thought you said 35, not 25, <laughs> brother. <laughs> Stroking the oh. beard, taking down another, you know, swig of whiskey, laughing with the boys. I love it. That's yeah, great. He's just like, fuck you. 30 years this biz. <laughs> right? Yeah, hell yeah. Him and Jado. <laughs> This uh, and then Bullet Club War Dogs, Clark Connors, and Drilla Maloney uh, defending the junior heavyweight tag team titles against Catch 2 2 of Akira and TJP. These are my preferred War Dogs. I can't stand Gabe Kidd right now. He's got go away heat with me. It's a little too on the but, nose. Uh, yeah, it's a little too much. It's too much. Calm down, buddy. I, you know, it's just. You're a heel. We get it. Matches aren't ever. You're a heel. Good. We yeah, got exactly. it. We heard yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> we heard you. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> So this is my is, you find it odd that Ga- that Drilla Maloney got a spot on the Wrestle Kingdom card, but Gabe Kid didn't. And do you think that eats at Gabe Kid's craw a little bit? Oh, of course, you know, he's does. been in the yeah. system way longer, and he trained there, and he's a dojo boy. Now I get that th- this the these War Dogs are champions. Like I, I understand all that, but still, you know, you book this shit and you put Gabe Kid in the Rambo, presumably. And Drilla Maloney. Now, Clark Connors is a dojo boy, too. That's okay. That's, you know, kid can't be mad about that one. But you think he's a little annoyed about Maloney? A little? I would be. Might be, right? I would be. Yeah, he jumped the line a little bit. He jumped the line. He jumped the line. But Maloney has the feud with those other two guys. Because he deceived them and turned on them. So, I don't know. Maloney had the story, right? I don't know. Yeah, I, I I could see it being a little because yeah, Gabe's gonna be in the Rambo, and I can't imagine he's too happy about that. And speaking of, then of course we got the pre-show uh, King of Pro Wrestling title 2024 Right to Challenge Rambo match, which you know it's a Rumble that'll end with four people, and then they're gonna have the KOPW match. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always harmless fun. It's never good, but it's always it's always a little too long. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's always like. It's fun, and I then say you're the like same thing every year. Though I don't care if it's not good because it's a pre-show fucking battle royal, right, 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 Royal right. Rumble, and and Japanese battle royals always suck. It's just something that Japanese wrestling has never done well, and it's just you just pop for who comes out. You hope there's some surprises, right? You, know? you hope there's Scott Norton, and if there's it's... no Scott Norton, you just go okay, whatever, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, you know, I will say this: they're unpredictable because sometimes guys who are like kind of big stars get thrown out like second. You're like, Oh, that's weird. Kojima's at the second guy out of this thing. And Chase Owens is in the final four, you know? So from that standpoint, they're kind of unpredictable. Chase is on a plane, by the way, for people that were wondering. So, uh, didn't get all mad about that all over again, but Chase is on, on the plane. Tracking, what are you tracking his plane? No, no, you know he, I just, he just like tweeted it out or whatever. And I saw people be oh, like, okay. oh, God, come on. And I was like, well, of course he was going to be in the Rambo. Get out of here. I don't know. Like, I, listen, I don't know how many times I have to say it. <laughs> he's not going to he get will, fired by that company anytime he's soon. He's never getting fired. He has a job for life until leadership changes. They feel he's loyal and he saved their ass multiple times. He's not going anywhere. Okay. 
Gato is not stroking his beard, scanning fucking speaking out rumors from four years ago on English fucking Facebook pages. I, I, I'm sorry that's the case, but he's not going anywhere ever. So you can drive yourself crazy by just complaining about it into perpetuity, but they, the guy was loyal to them and they're going to be loyal to him. He's got a job for life. If the same people remain in charge, can we stop now? He's not going. <laughs> no, I'm not saying you have to like it. I don't care whether you like it or not. I'm, what I'm telling you is he's never going anywhere. And that, folks, is Wrestle Kingdom. So, again, we will be there live immediately after the show on Instant Reaction Live, $10 tier all over there at flagshippatreon.com. Uh, if you're a subscriber, you are also going to be able to get the World's End one that we did over the weekend. So make sure you uh, go back and listen to that if you are a new subscriber or you missed that. And, uh, yeah, I think we are done here. So, uh, again, we'll be back Thursday at some point in the morning. I think it's yeah usually around 5 a.m., 6 a.m. Uh, Eastern, somewhere in that range. But, uh uh, if you're going to be watching, you'll know. So you'll be watching Wrestle Kingdom, you'll know. Uh, hopefully, uh, New Japan World. I know there's been some issues with the live streams of the new New Japan World, but hopefully it uh, holds up pretty well uh, for Wrestle Kingdom. But uh, I guess we'll find out on Thursday. So VoicesOfWrestling.com as well for the previews, reviews, and columns that we talked about throughout this show. Uh, VoicesOfWrestling.com slash Discord if you want to join the conversation on our Discord. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we have our YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe to there on YouTube, uh, as well as the Voice of Wrestling Podcast Network on your podcast app of choice. So make sure uh, you look up Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network or subscribe to all the individual shows that we have on the network as well. Uh, they're all up there as uh, uh, for you to subscribe to. So that is it for us. That is Joe. I am Rich. We will talk to you guys next time. Take care. Hey, kids, do you like wrestling? Well, we like wrestling, too. We are Shake Them Ropes here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network. Myself and Chris Novembrino kind of doing a lazy river of wrestling criticism, going through the news and whatever happened in stateside television wrestling. And also, you know what? Sometimes we just like to watch old stuff and talk about that, too. Love for you to give us a listen. If you haven't already, we are Shake Them Ropes here on the Voices of Wrestling Podcasting Network.